Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a little bit before 9 a.m. here in Chicago. It's a pretty sunny day, and uh, it doesn't feel like the world is ending. I hope um, you guys all, wherever you are, have a little bit of perspective um, and are managing. I know that uh, some places it's really difficult, and um, I'm hoping that maybe we can just uh, get lost in a little retouching today, uh, kind of zone out. Um, for whatever that's worth. Uh, I don't think we're gonna solve any of the world's problems, but I don't know, maybe uh, just a couple minutes of um, not thinking about all of our immediate issues will be of some benefit. So um, I'm just gonna give it a couple of minutes before uh, I, I start and walk you guys through um, uh, what I'm gonna be doing, just let everybody get settled in. Um, I don't know if you need to get some popcorn or a drink or a, a martini, depending on where you are, um, or use the bathroom or something like that. Um, I will try to uh, respond to as many of the uh, comments as I can. Uh, I'm seeing them, they are just flying by, so it's, it, may, it may be really hard to see them. I mean, literally, they're just whipping across my screen right now. Um, but I will do my best uh, to explain what I'm doing and to answer questions that you guys have. Um, and uh, we'll see how long this goes. Uh, I have some other paintings that also need some retouching. And if um, we burn through this really quickly, uh, I don't know, maybe you guys can watch me clean up my studio or do some paper <laughs> paperwork or something else like that. Um, <clears throat> All right, so this is a painting by the early um, American Hudson River School painter, George Hetzel. He was a kind of a, a proto Hudson River School painter. <clears throat> and the Hudson River School were a bunch of artists uh, living in New York uh, who um, went up and down the Hudson River, um, up north to upstate New York and painted kind of early American landscapes and started to help define um, an American uh, painting uh, style um, and motif that uh, gained widespread praise uh, all over the world. Um, and it was kind of the first, one of the first times that Europeans who had great vistas and great landscapes and a great tradition of landscape painting recognized that America actually had something to offer. Um, they did a lot of uh, beautiful tonal scenes, a lot of um, working on light and um, uh, atmosphere. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I was just uh, trying to um, turn on slow chat so uh, I can actually see what you guys are doing. And I guess it's already on, but you guys are just going so fast. Um, <laughs> Anyhow, uh, okay, so <clears throat> this painting, um, it's been cleaned. The story with this painting is that the owners who were descendants of George Hetzel um, found a, a catch of paintings in a basement, I believe, and after a massive flood, they were cleaning out the basement and they found all these paintings. And um, they were covered in mold and mildew and had tremendous amount of water damage and uh, paint loss. Um, you guys are all telling me that uh, slow chat is not on. Um, I am running this on my phone and I don't uh, see another option for this. Let's see, no, we're not gonna do any effects. Um, whatever, we'll just, I'll just figure it out, I'll make it work. It's not the end of the world. I'm a big boy, I can, can figure this out. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, so they found these paintings, they were really in bad shape. Um, all of this was flaking. So when I got this painting, the paint was just popping right off of the canvas. And I mean, to say that it was in a precarious state is an understatement. I mean, all of these areas around here were lifting up. They look like potato chips and you could blow on the painting and all of this paint would um, just flake right off. So a bunch of treatments were done to stabilize the painting, to secure all of this loose paint back down. 
Um, and it was cleaned, of course, it was restretched. Anyhow, we're now at the last step, which is the retouching process. And all of these areas where you see uh, white are areas where paint had been lost. Um, and this white is fill-in material, and you can see there's still some excess around uh, all of these little areas where I filled in. And this, I'm, I'm gonna remove this. Um, and uh, so this is necessary because if you imagine this being the plane of the painting, and uh, this is the, the paint, and if there's a paint loss, there'd be a little divot, kind of like when a golfer hits uh, and takes a piece of grass out. And I could certainly retouch into that divot using my paint and the color would match, but from the side, from a raking light, you know, from an angle like this, you would see all of those little divots. And um, those divots would be problematic because they would look terrible and they would um, betray all of the hard work that's gone into the painting conservation thus far. So the fill-in medium is um, applied and then I, I remove most of it using uh, little cotton swabs and um, uh, and, and, and water and, and some solvent. And then the last part, I have just a little of this residue. I'm just taking a little cotton ball with um, some odorless mineral spirits, and I'm just going to go over the painting. And this does a couple of things. This um, will pick up any of that excess residue. And also, you can see that the painting is just getting much more vibrant right now. And so this will simulate what the varnish is going to look like when I put it on. And this is important because if you notice, as I'm going over these areas with this little cotton swab, um, the colors are getting richer. They're getting denser or darker. Uh, and that's those are the colors that I need to retouch to. And if I don't do this, and I do the retouching kind of according to a dry, washed out painting, when I apply the varnish, all of that retouching is going to look different. It's going to look wrong, so to speak. And um, then I'm going to have to take it off and do it again, which is not the end of the world, but if I can do it right the first time, why not? So uh, no, the dog is not here. She is at home uh, with the kids and the family um, because... Uh, Every time she seems to come to the studio, she eats something that causes her to get sick or have to go to the vet. Uh, maybe it's the end of my paintbrush or, or some garbage. I mean, she's a dog. Everything on the floor is, um, is food <laughs> to her. Uh, and a conservation studio is probably not the best place for her to be eating. Um, the song that's at the beginning of my videos is one that I had composed by a friend. It's just, it's not really a song. It's just a, a 10 second um, musical um, intro, um, just, you know, thematic. Um, can a clean painting be too cleaned? Um, you know, a painting can be over cleaned, but, um, too clean is, I mean, it's kind of like, can your face be too clean? There, there's not really too clean. There's clean and not clean. Um, certainly the painting can be over cleaned and that's a problem. Um, but, uh, too clean, not really. Uh, for this painting, this technique that I'm going to be using for retouching is just fully integrated uh, retouching. Uh, I guess the, the, the Italians would call that mimetech as opposed to trategio or trategio, um, which is uh, kind of um, a little sketching or hash marks or something like that. Um, Uncut Gems was a great movie. It gave me a lot of anxiety, though, um, but it was really good. Um, Let's see, uh, this video stream will be on my YouTube channel, so if you guys miss it, you can, um, you can watch it later. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start getting going, um, and this, I'm gonna show you guys my palette. I know this palette looks like a hot mess and looks like garbage, but all of these paints are, are, um, are retouching paints, so they're fully uh, reversible. So all of this stuff, even though it's all dry right now, I can apply um, a little bit of uh, solvent and medium, and this is going to reactivate. So I, even though it looks like a hot mess, this is a really great benefit because let's say I need to mix a green, I can just go here and I can start with greens that I already have mixed or a turquoise or blue or a yellow or something like that. So um, it allows me to kind of jump start. I don't really have to um, start fresh. On big paintings or really long uh, projects, I may start with a brand new palette just because it gives me kind of a clear headspace, um, and it also allows me to um, kind of control the colors that I'm using so that they're all within the, um, 
within what the painting has. Yeah, this is a relatively new palette. It's one I started for um, a big project that will be upcoming on my YouTube channel um, in maybe a month or so. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, I guess I should just get down to it. Um, I'm not sure where I want to start. Um, uh, usually I like to start in somewhere that's kind of forgiving and easy um, and leave some of the more exciting and challenging things um, for the end when I've uh, done a little bit more retouching. But it's also like carrot and, like a carrot. Um, so like maybe this area is really exciting. So I'll leave this to the end, give myself something to look forward to. Um, and so I can get through this stuff, which isn't all that exciting. Um, I do save my palettes. Um, you know, I try to use them as long as I can. Uh, at, at a certain point they become really muddy. And if you bear with me, I'll show you one of those that I had used for quite some time. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I am definitely gonna knock the easel or the camera several times, um, so I'm gonna apologize in advance. So this is an old palette that I um, had been using for a long time, and you can see the difference. I mean, this is full of paint. And I, at this point, it's just kinda not really usable anymore. You can see the little wells where I can mix colors, but, you know, I mean, look at how, whoop, sorry, again, this is gonna happen a lot. Um, you can see just how much paint is on this thing. Um, so I, I save it, I don't know, because I just don't wanna throw it away. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, this palette, I, I can't really use this one anymore. Um, anyhow, um, auction it off to you guys, you guys are crazy. Uh, um, uh, interesting story, the first time I retouched a painting completely by myself, uh, a really big painting, my father took the palette and he framed it uh, with a little frame that he had lying around and he gave it to me uh, kind of as a, uh, a gift um, or just kind of like a congratulations. Uh, and I still have that um, in my house and that was 20 some odd years ago. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna get started. Um, and the oldest painting I've retouched, probably 1480 that I just uh, finished up, just went back to uh, the client. My name, my name is Julian Baumgartner. Um, so uh, what kind of brushes do I use? Um, these are Princeton Summit. 6100R round brushes. Um, they are, um, they're not anything fancy. Uh, and the reason I don't use fancy brushes is because I pretty much destroy them. I mean, I burn through them pretty quickly. So these are all the different sizes of brushes. These brown ones are natural hair brushes and I don't really like using them that much because they, um, they disintegrate too quickly. So these are the brushes when I get them new and after I have used them a lot, you can see what they look like. I mean, pretty, pretty shot. All the points are gone. I save these because I can use them. No, if you drink every time I say, um, you guys aren't gonna make it more than 15 or 20 minutes. Sorry, um, 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 um. Anyhow, so these are the brushes <clears throat> after I've used them. Sometimes they last uh, a week, sometimes they last a month, but they're not anything expensive. Um, and I've tried using expensive brushes and I just waste a lot of uh, money. My father was from Switzerland, um, um, there you go, and uh, he emigrated to America. So I do have Swiss and German roots, but you know, like everybody else, I'm kind of a mutt. I have family from all over the world. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm now procrastinating getting started. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's get going. Uh, let's see. If I can, I'm gonna try to mix colors on the palette so that you guys can see how I'm doing that. And then I will switch, I don't know, we'll just figure it out. So uh, you see how I'm, I can just reactivate that color. That brown is now soluble, just with a little bit of solvent. So it was dry a minute ago, now it's soluble. These paints that I'm using are made by an Italian company called My Mary, and they're specifically de designed for conservation and retouching. And I have others designed by Gamblin and Golden, um, but the biggest thing is that they don't contain oil. So they won't oxidize and cross-link 
uh, and fully harden like oil paints. And the resin binder that's in them can be reactivated in the future with a solvent, and then I can uh, remove them uh, if ever need be. So I'm just going ahead to try to mix a brownish color for this area. And I know I get you guys ask a lot of questions about how to mix colors, and unfortunately there isn't any trick. It's kind of like everything. It's like baking or cooking, not baking. You know, at first you're following, you're trying to follow a recipe very uh, deliberately, and then you start realizing that you can just kind of feel your way through it. And in my videos, I've said a lot that retouching and color matching is kind of like how a dog's sense of smell works. And at this point, this is pretty much cliched for me and I should probably put it on a t-shirt. Uh, the dog smells both the whole and the parts at the same time. So if you bake a cookie, when you smell the cookie, you smell cookie. And what the dog smells is cookie, but the dog also smells the flour that's been toasted, the salt. They smell the, the burnt butter. They smell the, the chocolate, all that kind of stuff. So it, the dog can smell the sum and the parts at the same time. And for me, as a conservator who's done a lot of retouching, I can see a color as, you know, let's say this color right here, it's brownish red, right? But what I see is a little burnt umber, I see a little cadmium red, a touch of white, um, actually a little bit of blue because I, there's a little bit of coolness to it. Um, and then I can mix it all together. And once I have something that I think is gonna work, uh, I will try to go ahead and um, see, how I, see how I fare. So I'm just laying down some, some initial brush strokes, and this isn't necessarily the final. I mean, obviously you can see that that's not perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a little bit of white and maybe a little bit of cadmium red. Uh, yes, this is titanium white for all of you guys who watch Bob. Um, and yes, I watched Bob Ross when I was a little kid. Uh, I think everybody did. And uh, when he's on, I still watch him because he gives me all the feels, just like he gives you guys all the feels. Uh, there is a great um, podcast from Outside Magazine. I think it's Outside Magazine, where they did a whole episode on the magic of Bob Ross, believe it or not. I mean, who would think Outside Magazine would do uh, an episode on a painter? But it was really fascinating because they, they were drawn into it because he's a landscape painter and they're an outside um, outside adventure magazine. But they kind of went down the rabbit hole and uh, they, they discovered some really interesting things about Bob Ross and had some really cool philosophical kind of realization. So I highly recommend, it's short, it's like 25 minutes or something like that. If you guys are at all interested, look it up. It's the Outside Magazine podcast. I don't know where it is in their feed. I don't remember how old it is, but it was really interesting. Uh, and I think you guys would all really enjoy it if you like Bob Ross, if you like art, if you like things. Um, do I make my own artwork? Uh, you know, I used to a lot, but right now I have a young family, I'm running a business, uh, I have all of this YouTube stuff and Instagram stuff. Um, I just, you know, bought and moved into this building, so there's still projects to do. I'm just kinda short on time. I keep a sketchbook, uh, and at some point in my life when I have some free time, I will start making my own artwork again. You know, making artwork for me has long transcended the space of wanting to sell it or, you know, have international acclaim or, or even show it. Uh, it's kind of more of a Zen meditative process. Um, and also, it's entertaining for me. Uh, so I'll pick it up at some point. You know, the, the skill doesn't go away. Um, it, it'll always be there. I just don't have time for it right now. Uh, also, kind of one of the things about working on art all day long and working with materials all day long, there's this old cliche that the cobbler's kids never have shoes. Cobblers are, uh, that's what a person who makes shoes is. Sorry, a train's going by. Anyhow, um, so the cobbler's kids never have shoes. Well, the conservator's walls are always blank, I guess, would be a good uh, ism. Because 
I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this all day long. I'm working with materials all day long. Some days when I get home, all I want to do is not be around art. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but um, the, there's a great chef in Chicago, Grant Ackett's. He's the owner of Alinea, and, uh, which is a Michelin-rated uh, molecular gastrono gastronomic uh, restaurant, mm. wonderful restaurant. And he was asked, you know, oh my, your kids must have all the amazing food, you know, all this crazy cool stuff. And he says, eh, we order a lot of cheeseburgers and pizza. And I get it. I mean, you know, you, you just kind of get burnt out doing all day long and then coming home and trying to do it. Um, holy cow, I'd like to uh, answer some of these questions, but they're just flying so by. I'm also looking at them on my iPhone, so there's a lot less space. Um, let's see. Anyhow, so uh, as you can see, I'm just kind of plodding along and, and trying to use the color where uh, I think it's going to fit, but uh, as it the color changes, I need to change it too. So I'm adding a little bit of um, Alizarian Carmine, which is kind of a red, a really great um, dark, broody red, <laughs> full of Ikea paintings. No, my house is not full of Ikea paintings. It's, it's mostly full of paintings that uh, I traded for friends in art school uh, and things that I have made, my wife has made uh, over the years. Uh, we've bought a couple of small little things, nothing expensive, nothing fancy. We're not, we're not, we're not big collectors or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the art that I like looking at is not necessarily the art that I want to live with, case in point. I really like Goya's Horrors of War, but I, I don't think I'd want to see that first thing in the morning before I've had coffee. Uh, some people do, and that's that's totally cool, but I don't know, not for me. Anyhow, uh, so I'm working on this kind of bluish, brownish area, and I'm trying to stay within that kind of color so that I don't have to remix. I mean, if obviously I jumped over here, I'd have to make a whole new color, and then I'd have to jump back here and make a new color, and here and make a new color. Yeah, I have watched Faker Fortune. I really like that show. Um, I think some of it is really interesting. I also think that like any TV show, it is a reality show. And so a lot of what um, appears on that show, I suspect is fabricated for TV, um, which doesn't mean that it's bad TV. It's just TV. So keep everything in, you know, keep all that in mind. Um, it's kind of like all those house flip shows where everybody uh, starts crying uh, on the reveal. Uh, I, I sometimes think that they're told tears would be great at this moment. Feel free. Um, yeah, super chat, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I could do, I'm, I'm on my phone, so I'm not, uh, whatever. We'll just make do with this. This is the first one. We'll figure it out. And uh, if, it, if it works, it works. If not, we'll change it, right? There's, there's no problem. We all have all day. I have nothing to do here, I'm at work. Um, and to that point, I commute alone from my house to my work. Uh, I work alone. I am not accepting clients. I have a vestibule where uh, the mailman and, and UPS leave their uh, packages. So I'm not in contact with anybody other than my family. And most of the day, uh, I am wearing PPE, personal protective equipment, respirators, uh, gloves and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I am doing uh, as much as I can to isolate and keep myself and everyone around me protected. Uh, by nature, being a conservator and kind of the work that I do, um, I'm already kind of isolated. So at this point, I've done a little bit of work here and I just kind of want to take a check to see how, uh, see how it's looking. So I'm gonna take that cotton ball again and I'm going to go over this area, and this is what it will look like when it's varnished. So that's first go around, and I don't know if you guys can see, I don't know how good the light is here, but I need to do some adjustments. So I do work on multiple pieces at a time. Any week, I may be working on 10 to 15 pieces. Some of those will be completed within the week. Some of those are you know, longer projects that take several weeks. Uh, some take months. 
but I try to keep a balanced schedule so that on any given day or any given week, I'm not doing too much of one thing. And that is, I don't want to set up a schedule whereby next week I have 25 paintings that need a ton of retouching because it's just exhausting and it burns you out pretty quickly. Conversely, uh, even though I have two hot tables, I don't want to have too many paintings. I don't want to have like 15 paintings that need the hot table all day long because I just don't have the equipment to do that. So I try to keep a balance um, and uh, also keep myself interested and engaged. Uh, you know, different projects require different skill sets and different approaches and making sure that I'm not overdoing one thing, like scraping, you know? Like if I'm doing a painting that has a lot of scraping, I am definitely only gonna do one of those. I'm not gonna like put three of them on the schedule for one week because it would kill me. It would make me go mad. Um, so that's how I keep a balanced schedule. How long have I been doing this? Uh, I have been doing this for, uh, let's see, full time, let's see, about 20 years. Um, and uh, before that, I was doing it for a couple of years, kind of part time learning, uh, apprenticing. Um, so, uh, my most, did I ever consider another job? Um, I don't know that world famous artist or international playboy is a job. <laughs> um, uh, I guess if I had to do it all over again, I might consider being a furniture builder, an architect or a carpenter. Um, I like designing things. I think architecture would be really fun. I think furniture building is a great balance between architecture, design and craft. Uh, and then carpentry is kind of like the purest of crafts. I have a lot of respect for carpenters and contractors. Um, I think that that's a really fascinating world to be in and one that's full of problem solving and creativity. And even though you guys, you know, even though people may not think that, you know, the, the plumber or uh, the drywall hanger is creative, you give it a shot and see just how hard it is to achieve a perfect product and how much creativity is required. So anyways, I have a tremendous respect for what is called the trades. Um, and my happiest place is when I am uh, watching This Old House reruns. Um, that That is whatever tinkles you guys get from watching my videos, I get from watching um, uh, this old house. So that's a super favorite of mine. Big shout out to them. I don't know. Uh, I hope they hear that because a uh, um, uh, really, really fantastic show. And actually, believe it or not, I have cribbed several um, strategies or techniques or tips from uh, from tradespeople. Uh, and not just on TV, from like Norm Abrams, um, Tommy Silva, Rich Trithrui, um, Roger Cook, yes, I know them all. Um, but also from the trace people that I've met uh, along the way who have worked on projects of mine. Uh, you know, these are people who come up with really creative, inventive solutions to problems. And that's really what being a craftsman is. And art conservation is really kind of the same thing. At its heart, if you're a conservator, your job is problem solving because no painting that comes into your studio is without problems. Every one of them has a problem and needs a solution. And so it's your job to figure out that uh, solution. And sometimes those solutions are obvious or rote or predictable, and that's a nice easy day. Uh, but sometimes they are not. Sometimes they're complicated and they require you to use a technique that you've never used or um, introduce a new material or invent a technique or employ a material that uh, was never used for conservation before. And, or you know, in some cases, build a piece of equipment or a tool to help you do something or appropriate a tool or a technique. And that's really what, um, what makes this job exciting is, is the unknowns, the challenges, yes. The, the simple painting that just needs to be wiped off and cleaned is, uh, is certainly a nice, um, 
is nice, <laughs> I guess. Um, but the ones that make you pause and say, oh boy, okay, I got it. Okay, this one, I roll up my sleeves and really think about that one. Those are the ones I think that all conservators live for. Uh, those are the ones that sustain us. The harder the project, the more it demands of you, uh, the more skill it requires, the more creativity, inventiveness, like all that stuff. Um, uh, let's see, have I ever turned away a job? Um, you know, my, my barometer for doing work is, can I make a positive impact on this painting? Can I affect a positive change? And that is, if the painting has a problem, am I going to be able to satisfactorily work on this painting such that the client feels that they have received the best service and a product, an outcome that meets their wants, needs, and expectations. Uh, and sometimes that, that isn't possible. And I will say it is mostly not because of the painting. Paintings are, are just objects. They don't, they don't have perspectives or um, uh, wants and needs, I guess. Uh, it's mostly clients with um, unrealistic expectations. And in those cases, I, you know, it's delicate, it's tricky to tell somebody that uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to work together, but I try to be as open and honest with them as possible because that's the best policy. And, you know, I, I would rather turn somebody away and have them feel okay about it, or at least that they understand why, than take on a job that I know isn't gonna be productive for either of us and then have a problem in the end. You know, it's kind of like if you see some poop on the ground, you can do a lot to avoid it. Walking in it and then complaining that it's on your shoe, I mean, that's just your fault and you don't get any sympathy. Um, that's a terrible analogy, I don't know. I have little, little kids, so everything in my life now is poop. Um, how long did it, uh, take me to match colors so well, uh, I'm still, still learning. You never stop, right? I mean, there are days when uh, I do retouching and I think I, I did a rock star job and I come back the next day and I think, were you drinking or something? What, did you have one eye closed? You know, and that's you know, just is what it is. Um, so Bob Ross paintings uh, are almost all of them, so it's interesting, Bob Ross created for each painting that he did on the show, he created three paintings. There's, there's one which is a sketch, kind of like a, 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 a mock-up for him to follow, and that, you couldn't see it on the show, but those were um, off camera, and so he would look at them, so he kind of had a guide of what he wanted to do, kind of like a, a cheat sheet. Uh, then he created the one on camera, and then he created, after the show, he would then recreate uh, kind of a higher fidelity version of that painting um, so that he could have it photographed for a catalog uh, and for um, uh, promotional stuff. The interesting thing is that all of the paintings, save a very, very few, and we're talking like five, are still held by the Bob Ross Foundation. He didn't sell them. He gave some to some friends, who, you know, like the cameramen or the producers of the show, but he kept almost all of them. So there's like 600 paintings he made that they still own. And it's crazy because uh, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, frankly, I think that if, if he put them up for auction or they, they were put up to sell, I think that they would, they would go in a minute. Uh, I think a lot of people have really fond memories of the paintings. I think they, um, are a type of painting that is really pleasant and satisfying to a large percentage of people. And I don't know if the art world, so to speak, uh, feels the same way, but yeah, who cares? Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, they're like in a warehouse in West Virginia. Good call. Um, oh, let's, I got this phone. I'm going to turn it off. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh God, a lot of chats are flying by. Um, anyhow, 
So I'm, now I'm working on this area where there's a lot more loss and uh, I'm just building up uh, the paint. This paint is not 100% um, opaque uh, or sometimes it can be mixed not opaque. So I sometimes have to layer. Um, sorry, I gotta turn that off. Um, that's my stretcher uh, manufacturer. Um, and uh, he's probably calling to tell me that uh, there's a problem or something like that. Anyway, um, it's just one thing that, another, another thing. Um, let's see, are certain styles easier to retouch than others? Oh yeah, obviously. Um, I would say that abstract expressionism is really, really easy to retouch. And, and it's not because it's not a complex body of work, but abstract expressionism has a lot of energy within the canvas and the paint. And uh, for lack of a better word, it, they're very busy. And so when, they're, when the painting is really busy, it's really easy to, the, the kind of the margin of error is broader. Um, you know, if there is a tear through the face of a English royal's portrait, Sorry, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Um, a tear through the face of a, a, a really beautiful portrait. Not only is that like a really hard thing to retouch because it's, it's the face, but it's right where everybody's gonna look. So it's really gotta hit the mark. Now, like this area that I'm retouching here, much of this, a quarter inch of this is just gonna be covered by the frame. So this isn't, it's not, like that this isn't important, but like all of this area is gonna get covered. So it's certainly less high stakes than right here, which is kind of the focal point um, uh, of, of the piece. I'm trying to read these. You guys are sending them so fast that it's really, really hard. Um, if at any point, uh, oh, hold, sorry. Da, 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 da. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, yeah, I've tried to enable slow mode. I'm on my phone. I can't. I can't do it. It, you know, it is what it is. It's, you know. Plus, you guys are just rapid firing these things off. Um, I figured that if I talk long enough, uh, I'll probably answer most of your questions inadvertently. And if not, well, we'll just do it again. Um, so. The reason I started with this brown area and these edges and stuff like that is because it's kind of forgiving. And, you know, it's morning here. I just started. Um, I'm not quite warmed up. Um, you know, it's kind of like before you go play a game of basketball, you, you just dribble around, shoot around a little bit, limber up. Um, kind of the same thing here. Uh, I need to get familiar with this palette that this artist used. I need to get familiar with how I'm operating today. If I'm you know, on point, I hope I am, uh, if I'm, you know, just variables. Uh, so starting off in the most important section of the painting, which would probably be right here, it's probably not a great thing. I'm just gonna start off in an area that is a little bit more forgiving um, and then work my way over to that and, and see how that goes. What got me into conservation? Oh boy. Um, yes, I edit all my videos. I also shoot them all. Uh, what got me into my, into conservation? Um, you know, I mean, my father was a conservator. And so when I was a little kid, I spent, you know, sick days and, and days off from school at his studio, just kind of being a little kid, you know, playing and, and, and doodling and kind of stuff like that. I was always into art. Uh, I always made art. Um, both my parents were artists. So it's kind of in our blood. My grandfather is an architect. My uncle is a, a jeweler. Uh, my aunt is um, a writer and in radio. Uh, I have an, a doctor in the family. She's, I guess, the black sheep. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Uh, so kind of art is something that I've always been surrounded by. And so it never seemed like it wasn't a possibility for a career. I went to art school. My parents were completely supportive. They didn't think I was crazy. Um, in fact, they thought, that it was completely normal. And so, uh, you know, a as I was in art school, I started to work with my father a little bit, um, partially because I found that some of the, the information and education I was getting in art school I was lacking. There was absolutely no um, 
there's really no education about materials. And materials are so important in art making, right? I mean, this is the stuff that you are using uh, to make your art. Idea is really important, but materials and technique is also really important. And so I started um, spending more time with my father trying to learn about materials uh, and, and techniques, like how to stretch a canvas and how to prime it and you know, how to varnish and all those kind of things that I was, wasn't learning in school. <clears throat> and then as I spent more and more time with him, I started to see the ins and outs of what a conservator does. And I started to think that that was really awesome. Um, I was always wary of the art world kind of writ large and the requirements to uh, social network uh, and um, kind of kind of do all that kind of stuff. Uh, it just didn't seem like something I was well suited for or interested in. But the art making, I love making stuff. I love working with my hands. Uh, and so art conservation started to seem like something that would be really interesting. And, I, of course, my father said, uh, yeah, writ large is one of my favorite um, sayings. I think my family hates the fact that I use it, writ large. Um, <laughs> uh, anyhow, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. Um, no, my wife is not in this business. My kids are six and almost four. Um, oof, so many chats. Uh, oldest, oldest painting. Uh, I just completed one from about 1480. That's probably the oldest that I know of. I've worked on some icons, little small icons that may be older, but you know, with icons, it's so hard to tell. Um, and. Uh, Tips for somebody who wants to become an art restorer, art conservator. Well, now uh, there are many universities with um, programs uh, to train conservators. It's kind of become a very a mainstream career. And so there are many universities in Europe and in America that have degree programs. Uh, so that's something that you would want to look into. I know that the American Institute for Conservation their website is culturalheritage.org. They have a page, I think it's called How to Become a Conservator. And they outline um, some of the ways that you can become a conservator. Um, guys, I, I'm on my phone. I don't have the option to turn slow chat on. If I could, I would. Um, sorry. It's a desktop only thing. And uh, my desktop is not portable. It's a desktop. Um, just watch it later in, in slow-mo. <laughs> you can read all the chats. I mean, half of them are the same question. Uh, favorite artists? Um, all right. Favorite artist? I, I adore Jasper Johns. I adore John Singer Sargent. Um, I really like uh, Motherwell. I really like Franz Klein. Um, I really like Cecilia Bowe, uh, Ralph Clarkson. Um, I guess I kind of fall, my particular tastes fall into two categories. Absurdly romantic Bowe's Arts painting, Sargent, Robert Henri, Cecilia Bowe, Ralph Clarkson. Stuff where people just kind of painted super seductive uh, portraits. I love portraiture. Um, and then uh, I like abstraction a lot. Um, I like... Uh, pop art a lot, um, modernist art a lot. Um, but you know, it's kind of like your tastes are kind of like in art are kind of like your tastes in food. It's like some days you feel like having a pasta. Some days you feel like sushi. Some days you feel like, uh, I don't know, something else. So some days I feel like I don't want to look at landscapes. Uh, some days I only want to look at landscapes. And that's one of the really interesting and great things about art is there's so much of it that you can kind of just choose a daily meal of art and expose yourself. You know, much like you wouldn't only eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every single day. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, why would you only look at one type of art? Just like you may, you know, like you're probably not going to only listen to I don't know, 
EDM or drill music all day long. You might like to mix it up. Same thing with art, and I think too many people are afraid of doing that, of looking at art because it scares them or because they don't know how to think about it or process it, which is kind of absurd um, because you inherently, as a human being with eyes, ears, nose, mouth, senses, all that kind of stuff, who have lived a life, uh, who, are, who is living a life, you have the tools built in to understand art. There's no secret code book for understanding a piece of artwork. Uh, and, if you, and any of you who feel like you don't have those tools, I would really, really, really recommend that you look at Sister Wendy. I'm sure you can see some of the videos on YouTube. They're PBS. Sister Wendy was a nun who was an art historian who really broke down looking at art for people who didn't look at art. And it was, it was a kind of a revolutionary series because she was really kind of this unassuming little nun. And she, she opened up the world of art in a way that made a lot of sense to a lot of people. So look at Sister Wendy. Um, uh, do I like ballet? Um, yeah, I like most arts. I don't know much about ballet, so some of it probably flies over my head, but I can certainly appreciate it. Um, what do I think about digital art? I don't, you know, here's my, here's my feeling about art. The best art affects within you a feeling or an emotion that you can't quite explain and that you can't quite achieve any other way. The worst art does nothing for you. It's completely banal. It's completely disposable. It doesn't, it doesn't cause you to do anything doesn't give you any feels, doesn't make you angry, doesn't make you frustrated, doesn't make you happy, sad, or cry. It just doesn't do anything to you. That's bad art. Um, and so that's kind of how I feel about all mediums, digital, dance, music, whatever. Um, you know, the goal is to feel, right? Uh, and if something makes you feel, then it's achieved. Uh, uh, its its desired goal. Now, after making you feel, you want it to make you think, because that's where it starts to get really interesting. Because you're gonna want to think, why did it make me feel? Why did this painting make me feel sad? Okay, well, let's start taking a look at it. Let's let's open that up. Yeah, film is art, of course. TV is art too. Um, I mean, look. Every, just about everything that's done deliberately with intent can be art. Not everything is great, but it can be. Uh, writing can be art, you know, street performance, whatever. Anyways, um, YouTubers as art. Look, again, I'm not, I'm not here to make that assessment. There are plenty of smarter people uh, who understand the world of art more than I do who can decide and tell you what is and isn't good art. But like I said, man, if you like, if you like cheeseburgers and somebody comes along and tells you that cheeseburgers are no good, I mean, I'm guessing that your response is going to be something that I can't repeat on this stream. And so why would you let anybody else tell you about the art that makes you feel something? You know, I mean, my studio is filled with all sorts of artwork. And one of the, the most interesting things that happens when people come into my studio is they, they love to look around. And they love to look at things and go, oh my god, that's terrible. Ugh, that's an awful piece of artwork. Or look at that schlock over there. And it's funny because, um, I, I don't know, I find it funny because they have no uh, responsibility to like that artwork because it's not theirs. You know, it, I mean, who cares? Um, conversely, I don't really necessarily think they should be judging other people's artwork, but, or judging what other people like, but, you know, I guess we are in a very judgy time in the world where live and let live isn't really, uh, the norm. Maybe that's what we need more of. Um, let's see, what kind of music do I listen to? Uh, I, I actually listen to a lot of, um, National Public Radio. Uh, here in Chicago, we have an amazing station, WBEZ. 
that has really interesting programming. And so I listen to a lot of that because it's interesting uh, and it's kind of like food for my brain. Um, I'll listen to podcasts sometimes. Music, um, sometimes I'll put music on. It, again, it just kind of depends what mood I'm in. Um, you know, slow Miles Davis ballads if it's one of those days, or maybe I'll be listening to dub and reggae if I need something that's a little bit more um, upbeat and get me going. Um, and to be honest, there are some days when I don't even turn the music on or the stereo on, and I just... I'm just so busy or in such a zone that, uh, you know, it's like, boom, <laughs> day's done. Um, deadlines and flexibility, uh, yeah, sometimes I do. So I work with a lot of galleries and dealers and auction houses and people who are in the commerce end of the art world. And those people definitely have deadlines. Um, and they are sometimes always shifting and changing. Uh, so those I have to be conscious of. Um, I then have some clients uh, who say, I have no deadline. Take, it, take as long as you need. Um, just do the work as you need to do it. So obviously, uh, I try to balance things. You know, I don't want to have too many things that are uh, um, under super deadline because it's stressful. Um, but, you know, that's, that's more of like a business question, you know, managing um, deadlines and things like that and, um, and expectations about deadlines. Uh, and to be honest, that's something that nobody can teach you. You really just have to learn it trial by fire. Um, I guess I'm, I'm very fortunate in that when I was working with my father, I, I kind of learned all of that stuff, the business aspect um, from somebody who was in the midst of running a business. So it wasn't abstract or theory to me. It was kind of like real life. Um, and that was really uh, beneficial. Um, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Working with my father, <laughs> working for my father. Um, if any of you have ever worked with your family, it is the best and worst job at the same time. Um, and I will just leave it at that and you can <laughs> figure it out. Um, what does my family think about my YouTube channel? I don't know. I think, um, I think my wife thinks it's funny, uh, and kind of silly. I think my immediate family vacillates between, oh, this is really cool, and, um, uh, you're a dork, Julian? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, studio tour, yeah, I'll be putting one together, um, at some point. Uh... What is too much retouching? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, since all of the, the paints that I'm using are fully reversible, I can wipe all of this retouching off and it's gone and it won't harm the painting. So it's not a matter of saying that it's gonna damage the painting uh, physically. It may, damage, um, it may damage the integrity of the work, but the, the goal for the conservator when they're doing retouching uh, is to do the absolute minimum. That is, when I retouch this area here, I just want to stay within the boundaries of this. I don't. I don't want to just kind of go like like this, or you know, get a you know a big gold fat brush and just kind of blend it in. That's not appropriate. Just where the paint is missing, do I put new paint on? Um, and you know, there are people who do retouching who don't have that ethos. I don't think they would be call conservators, but um, anyhow, uh, yeah, these paints dry really fast. Um, they don't have any oil in them, as I mentioned earlier, so they, uh, they dry through solvent evaporation and not through cross-linking or oxidation or polymerization, which are the processes that happen with oil paint. Um, so yeah, and, and it's, it's good because it allows me to work on the painting kind of fast but it, it is also somewhat problematic at times because you can't glaze, you can't lay down transparent colors and you can't really build up because once I put a color down, if I go back over it, the new paint is going to reactivate the first layer of paint and it will probably pick it up. So it is, retouching is a very different mindset, both uh, conceptually uh, and in terms of execution than painting. 
And so it's, it's not a matter of being a good painter makes you a good retoucher. In fact, being a good painter may be counter uh, to being a good retoucher. And that's something that I had to learn because when I started, uh, I w was not a good retoucher. I, I was excessive. I, you know, I didn't, didn't understand the parameters in which I had to work. And then over time, oh man, these, those days when I would, I would spend a whole day retouching and I'd give the painting to my father for, for approval and we'd go look at it under the black light. And then I'd see him take a cotton ball with the solvent and just wipe off all the, all of my retouching and it would break my heart. You know, six hours of, of labor would just gone. And he would say, do it again. And I would do it again and he would wipe it off again. And, and he'd say, do it again. And man, we got into fights. Um, but the reason he was doing that is because it wasn't good. And he was trying to implore me to be better, to, you know, just to rise to the occasion, to become a better retoucher, a better conservator. And that's why he started me there, because all of that could be undone. Obviously, cleaning paintings took a lot longer because you can't put back what you take off um, from a painting. So if you take off too much of a painting, you, know, you can't just wave a magic wand and put it back. But if the retouching is lousy, uh, you, you can. You can wave a magic wand and it, it comes right off. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to look at some of these questions. Has there ever been a painting that couldn't be fixed? I mean, yeah, there are paintings that are too far gone. Um, it, it's tricky though, because at some point, there's almost always something that can be done to affect a positive change. Now, is that positive change gonna be enough for the client? Or is the cost of that positive change gonna make economic sense? Well, I mean, that's something that I can't answer, and to some degree, I, it's inappropriate for me to answer. I can tell my client it's gonna cost X and this is what you can expect. And then I can, I can leave it to them to make those final decisions. And I can point them to um, appraisers. I can give, get them second opinions, um, but I don't have to make that um, kind of moral calculus, which is good because I don't, I don't wanna have to make that. <laughs> it's, you know, it's hard. Uh, I have seen people with paintings that are worth many, many, many times more than all of the things that I own in this world uh, who argue and fight with me about very small sums of money. Uh, and I have seen people with very, very expensive paintings who refuse to invest any money into them to make them stable or, or clean them and whatnot. And then I have seen people with paintings that have absolutely no market value. I mean, paintings that, that on, on eBay wouldn't sell and they are willing to pour fantastic sums of money into them because they mean something to them. And, you know, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to get all Marie Kondo over here, um, but if it brings you happiness, if a piece of art, if an object, if a, a thing create, it transforms you, if it takes you someplace, if it affects within you an emotion, then it is valuable. And there is a, there is a compelling argument to preserve it. Now, if you're doing it because it's an investment, that's another story. Um, but, you know, I mean, we spend our lives working to make money. And what good is money aside from keeping us alive and sheltering and all that kind of stuff if you can't spend it to enrich your life? Um, anyhow, do I need uh, permission from my clients before filming? Yeah, of course. I, I get permission from all my clients before I film any of the works. Um, but at this point, I, am, I get more requests to film than not to film. And I wish I could film everything, but... Uh, you know, I, I just can't. It's, it's only one of me. So now I've done most of this brown area. I'm going to start moving over to this, this greenish area. Uh, and then maybe I'll switch over to here. 
I'm gonna move over to here because this is kind of a similar color and it's not too far of a reach to get from here to here. Whereas when I jump over here, it's a whole different color. So uh, I have all the toilet paper, all of it. I am the sole reason that there is no toilet paper in America because I work alone and I hoard it. Come on. Um, have I ever done any work for free? Uh, no. Um, I'm in business, after all. I, I will say this much. There was, a, and this is a good business lesson. Uh, here's, here's a business lesson for everybody. Actually, it's more of a life lesson. I should be giving life lessons. <laughs> um, I had a client come in, uh, an older woman, um, with a painting uh, that needed a little bit of work. It just needed a little cleaning. And... I gave her the proposal and she came back and said, you know, I'm on fixed income. I, I really can't afford this, but this is really important to me. This is something that uh, is important in my life and I would really like to have it done. Is there any, any movement? Could, could you give me a break here? And, you know, at that point I had two choices. I could say, yeah, okay. Or I could say, no, come on, this is a business. End of story. You can't go to a, you know, you can't, um, go to McDonald's and say, well, I, I don't want to pay $3 for that. Can I have it for two? So anyway, uh, I gave uh, the woman a pretty big discount and pretty much did it for what she told me she could afford. And I thought, okay, well, that's my kismet for the year and, uh, or for the week or the day, whatever. And I, you know, it, if that's, it's not a very big thing to do. I mean, there's certainly bigger ways to give back to the world and society and whatnot, but I thought, well, it's just a small thing I can do and it makes her happy, so fine, I'll do it. And uh, that was that. Uh, I lost money on it because the time and labor was more than, um, the, more than the cost of the conservation. Sorry, uh, I'm trying to talk, retouch, and read at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that was that. End of story. Fast forward to about a year. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch over to this area. So I'm going to, this is kind of a purplish, bluish gray. And I guess I'm going to mix that color. And let's see on my palette where I have a purplish, bluish gray that I don't mind mixing. It's a little brown. So I'll do it right here. This is kind of a gray. And I'm going to just reactivate this gray kind of as a base and then... I can modify it so that it matches. Uh, anyhow, so fast forward about a year later, and um, where is that? Let me get it on camera. It's right here. Okay. Uh, fast forward about a year later, and I get a um, a call from a seminary. In fact, the one uh, that I did that big uh, St. Francis painting, the video for. And they wanted me to come up and, and look at oh, hundreds of paintings they had in all states of disrepair and all that kind of stuff. So I went up there and I looked at it and uh, gave them some proposals and, and I thought I was just bidding on, on this job and I asked them when I would hear back about my bid and they said, well, there's no bid, you, you're, you've got the work. And I said, oh, I mean, thank you, yes, yes please. Um, uh, but you guys aren't bidding this project out. I'm just kind of curious. I'm, I'm not trying to give away um, work, but I'm, you know, I'd just like to know. And, and they said, well, our, on our board of directors is Mrs. So-and-so, and she insisted that when we had this work done, you were the one to do it, and she carries a lot of weight in this, in this congregation. Well, it turns out Mrs. So-and-so is the little old lady who I did the painting for and lost money on it. And it's just one of those life lessons about what goes around comes around. And I lost a little bit of money on, on that painting I did for her, but I was rewarded in spades by that massive job. And there were something like a hundred and some odd paintings that needed conservation. And, you know, maybe they would have gone with me one way or the other, but the fact that this woman felt that I had done something for her that was was bigger than a painting, you know, she pushed and lobbied her congregation. And so, you know, moral of the story, man, be nice to people, be kind, treat people well, treat people fairly, wear clean underwear, hug your grandma. Um, 
And that goes to like online stuff too. Like you guys have no idea who is out there and online. And I have received uh, messages from people um, on Instagram, YouTube, email, whatever, who have said, oh, you know, I saw your video or, hey, I saw how you responded to that semi-controversial post you put up on Instagram and I'm the director of such and such museum and I would like to have you work on such and such painting, right? So like, I don't know, just like think like everything you do, you are responsible for and uh, think about like, I don't know, being judged on everything you do. Anyhow, that's my life lesson for the day. How many paintings have I done? Uh, boy, I've probably worked on, I, I looked at my database uh, at one point and I think I was somewhere, this is a couple of years ago, around the eight or 9,000, high 8,000s. So I think at this point, I might have crossed 10,000, uh, maybe, I don't know. I'll have to go look at the database and, um, and see again. Uh, it's not a complete database, but it, it gives me a good approximation of how many I've worked on. Um, this painting, for all of you who are joining late or who don't know, this is a um, kind of early Hudson River School painting by George Hetzel. Uh, Hudson River School were a group of artists in New York, upstate New York, who painted American landscapes and kind of um, really beautiful works. And they, they were kind of the first artists to kind of grab the attention of the European artists and say, boom, we've got something to show you. Because, of course, the Europeans, with a long tradition of art making and masters, this didn't think that this upstart little company had, uh, company, upstart little country had anything to offer the art world. And so they were really kind of skeptical of any American art. Also because early American art was very um, naive. And I'm not saying like that it was bad. It was just that kind of like a style of art. Uh, and so when the Hudson River School burst on the scene, um, they, they kind of shot across the bow of the European artists. Uh, and a lot of them trained in Europe and, and eventually went to Europe to paint and took some of the techniques home. Anyway, uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, George Hetzel was one of the early uh, Hudson River School painters, and I think he was involved in founding some school or arts league or something. I'm not 100% positive on that. Um, this is just a little, little of his paintings. This is obviously not a grand master um, piece. Uh, have I ever ruined a painting? Uh, the answer to that is one that I will answer, but I will answer more thoroughly in a video that I am working on. Um, yes and no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's all you're gonna get today. Uh, and the reason I'm not gonna answer it right now is because uh, it's a really complicated um, uh, answer and I wanna do justice by it, uh, and I think um, that me rambling on about it isn't going to be as uh, clear and concise as if I have a chance to sit down and um, uh, think it out, plan it out. Anyhow, so how is my quarantine going? Um, well, in Illinois, in Chicago here, we are on a um, shelter-in-place order, which uh, kind of means if you don't have to, don't leave. Uh, and um, we can still go pick up food from restaurants. We can still go to the parks. Uh, you can still go to work if you are, if you work by yourself or if you are obviously an essential um, business, you know, like healthcare providers and stuff like that. Um, since I commute by myself and since I work by myself, I'm not really at risk. I'm not taking any uh, meeting with any clients. Um, and uh, since parts of the world that use my service are not under quarantine and their economies have not shut down, uh, I still have work to do uh, and I have work to get to them because their lives are as of yet undisrupted. Um, anyhow, uh, how did that messed up Jesus painting get so messed up? All right. I will talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in a video later. So uh, I will just, this is my one comment that I will make on the 
Eki Homo, Homo Eki, I can't remember the name, and the Cecilia Jimenez situation. That painting had been deteriorating for years on the side of that church in her hometown. And daily, almost daily, she went to the church and said, please do something about this painting. It is falling apart. It is an important painting. And they ignored her. They just didn't do anything. And so the painting continued to deteriorate. And at some point, she got fed up and she said, fine, if you aren't gonna do anything about this, I will. And that's where everything went wrong. And of course, it is her fault for trying to do something uh, that she was grossly unqualified for. But I would like to ask the question of the owners of the church, if they are supposed to be the stewards of the artwork, why did they let it fall into such disrepair? Why did they let it get to a state where a citizen thought that the only way to save it was to try herself? And so, yeah, a lot of blame goes to Cecilia Menez for, for doing that. But what about all the other people that let it get to that point? Now, if we're taking names, I'd like to have those people account for their lack of action. Anyhow, hi, Philippines. Um, let's see. Uh, how do I feel about fans visiting? Uh, not really. Um, my studio is, is a workspace, and it's my studio. And there's some liability and insurance issues, so it's not really like a, an open to the tour kind of place. Um, I know it breaks your heart to all of you who want to come here. Um, Let's see, uh, I get to work on new paintings, yes. Um, sometimes I get to work on paintings that are very new, uh, that have conservation problems. Um, I know I, I mentioned yesterday in a post that it seems like all I ever do is work on really old paintings. Um, that's definitely not the case. And I'm always on lookout for different types of paintings that would make interesting videos. It's, you know, it's just a matter of finding the right painting and, um, uh, finding one that is filmable, works into my schedule, all that kind of nitty gritty stuff. Um, how does conservation affect the value of a painting? Well, I mean, let's take a look at this painting. George Hetzel is a well-known painter. His paintings do sell pretty well in mar on the market. And uh, in its state when it came in, it was worth almost nothing. I'll post a photo of it um, on my Instagram stream, um, a before and after. Uh, after all this is done. So when it came into the studio, it was in such bad condition that the owner, in fact, said that he had spoken to some, some people, some dealers, and they had said, just throw it away. There's just absolutely no value in the painting. So now, even with the, all the work that I'm doing on the painting now, it's going to restore, again, the restoration, get it, uh, some of the value, if not all of the value, back into the painting. Um, and that is, you know, if the painting is, is a complete loss before I work on it, then the conservation and restoration will bring back the value. Now, that is also all predicated on the conservation being restrained uh, in accordance with modern practices and ethics and uh, using archival and reversible materials. So obviously, if I took oil paint and repainted this sky, that would not be good conservation, and that would not add value to the painting. But that I am using archival paints and varnishes and adhesives and materials that are reversible, I'm not doing anything that's permanent, so it can all be undone. And that's kind of a high bar. That's kind of like the, the, number, one, uh, the number one thing. Uh, so yes, it, it will restore value. And ultimately, if the person who ends up buying this painting, because I think it'll probably be sold, decides, well, you know, I, didn't I don't like Baumgartner's work, whatever the case may be. I don't like his style, I don't like his approach, or I just don't like those materials that he used. All of this stuff can be undone. It's, none of it's permanent. And, and reversed is different than removable. In my last video, I talked a little bit about the difference between reversible and removable. 
everything is removable. I could take a sandblaster or a belt sander and remove stuff from the surface of this painting. That doesn't mean that it's reversible. Reversible means that it was designed to be easily removed without uh, running risk of damage. And that's the big difference. So these are reversible materials. The chemists and conservators have worked in conjunction to design these materials so that if and when, because this will, painting will likely be conserved at some point in the future, be it 20 years, 50 years, 200 years. When it is conserved again, it is paramount that the next conservator can easily remove any or all of the work that I've done so that they can have a chance at doing it themselves. And they may not need to. They may say, this is fine. There's just, it just needs a light surface cleaning or um, it just needs to be retentioned on the stretcher bar or whatever the case may be. But if it has a new, like let's say it gets a tear in it, they may need to undo my work to facilitate the next round of conservation. And in that case, that I am using reversible and archival materials, hopefully their lives will be that much easier and they'll be able to look at my label and the report and say, oh, oh it's, this is a piece of cake, it's done. Um, it is teeny tiny painting. Uh, how, oh, how is my brother? My brother is very well, thank you for asking. Um, he, uh, every once in a while I drag him into the studio to help me with a project that is um, either building something or moving something or um, lifting something, 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 something. Um, and he's, he's not artistic, uh, but he is certainly handy and clever and um, I like him a lot and he and I work well together. So uh, when I was renovating my building, uh, this building here, uh, he helped me out quite a bit uh, and uh, always fun. Uh, if you can um, work with your your siblings, I highly recommend it. Um, again, you will fight, but there is almost nothing as rewarding as the synchronicity that comes with quietly working with somebody who is of your blood and the wavelength of harmony that you kind of get onto. Um, yeah, I am going to do a studio tour eventually. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, maybe this in the next couple months, I'll get that together. In the meantime, you can see a virtual studio tour of my studio. Uh, if you go onto my website, there is a 3D walkthrough of the studio from this past summer uh, where you can um, do it on your computer or your phone or if you have an augmented reality thing, you can do that. Um, Studio has changed a little bit since then, but it, it'll it kind of give you a, a basic layout um, and let you see into the studio. Um, is there any style I avoid, like Chinese, Japanese? Uh, no, there's not any style I, I avoid. Um, Japanese work on paper or silk is something that I'm not really suited to. I, I don't work with paper. Um, I, I work with paintings uh, or painted objects or other objects on canvas. Uh, so I would refer those to a paper conservator, um, somebody who I, I trust and would recommend because it's not my field of expertise and I wouldn't want to experiment or take on a project where I didn't feel uh, qualified or able to do the work. Um, so I have a, a broad network of conservators around the country and in other fields who uh, and dealers and galleries and appraisers and framers and art movers and art facilitators and museums and auction houses and da 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 all those people in the, in the business who I can refer if I feel like they are better suited to delivering a quality result to my clients. Um, that's part of taking care of your clients is understanding when you're not the right person for the job and pointing them to the right person. So again, this is just a little cotton ball with some odorless mineral spirits and I'm going over it and you see right there where I had just retouched before I went over it, it looked perfect. Doesn't look so perfect now. The mineral spirits kind of allows me to see what the painting is gonna look like after it's um, been varnished. And uh, so now I can go back in and re-retouch that area and make it look better because it doesn't look Right. Um, 
how do I do this and concentrate at the same time? Um, I don't know. I, it's hard. It's just like chewing gum and walking at the same time, you know. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, to some degree, some of this, the retouching is automatic. It, it's like part of my brain that um, I'm not conscious of. Like anything that you do long enough or have enough practice in, it kind of runs autonomously. Uh, the talking part is much harder for me, um, trying to make sure I'm making sense uh, and, and, I don't know, delivering interesting um, perspectives or content. Um, see, the talking part's hard, man. <laughs> I can do the retouching part all day long. Talking, that's a whole nother story. Uh, I'm not, me not good at talking. Um, what do I do to relax after work? What, do I, what else do I do besides work? Um, like anything, like any of you guys, I'm sure we all kind of do similar stuff. I, um, I spend time with my family. Uh, I watch TV. I ride a bike a lot. I ride my bike quite a lot. Um, and, uh, that kind of keeps me balanced and sustained. Um, I read. I waste time on the internet. Isn't that a hobby? Um, what do the tacks taste like? Uh, they just taste metallic. They just uh, taste like metal, which, I don't know, doesn't really... Um, yeah, my name is German. My father was Swiss, and Baumgartner means uh, the keeper of the trees. Interestingly enough, I lived for the majority of my life on Orchard Street, so there you go. I don't know. Fate had a, had a hand in that, I guess. Um, Worst part, I don't work on watercolor, watercolors uh, because that's a paper conservator's um, realm and I'm not a paper conservator. Uh, I would refer those to a paper conservator and those paper conservators would refer paintings to me. We have a nice little, uh, you know, symbiotic relationship where I can help them, I do. Where they can help me, they do. We keep each other happy. We don't step on each other's toes. We don't um, take each other's lunches, so to speak, and everybody lives a long and happy life and has a wonderful, successful business. The end. Um, let's see. Um, what do I think of my fans? Oh, do I play video games? No, I haven't played a video game since um, Grand Theft Auto like three, <laughs> or Goldeneye. Um, there's not a video game person. Um, how many pieces am I filming at one time? Uh, two, three, kind of depends on the piece. Um, how long should the conservation last? Uh, as long as it can, kind of depends. Um, I mean, I would say that a good conservation, you could get maybe two generations out of it before it might need to be addressed. So I don't know, is that like 60, 80 years? Maybe more. I don't know. Um, kind of depends how the, how the painting is kept. Oh, am I a Bears fan? Oh, yeah, I'm a Bears fan. Um, you know, I'm a Bears fan. I'm a Cubs fan. I'm a Bulls fan. We're having a, we're having a hard time right now in Chicago. We're, we're paying the price for... The Bulls are going to be bad for another decade. The Cubs, uh, I can't even talk about the Cubs. And, and the Bears, uh, I can't talk about the Bears. Um, I like sports ball. Um, I'll go Packers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But uh, if there was a way to, un, to, un, to remove that comment, I would. Sorry. Uh, anyhow. Um, how many years of studying does it take to do this? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, how many years of studying does it take to do anything? That's not really the question. The question is how many years of practice does it take to be proficient and to be, to be good? And I think the answer to that is N plus one. Huh? How about that? Um, what do I think of my fans? I think you guys are, are amazing. Um, I... <laughs> I think it's awesome. Uh, I, I think it's, it's crazy. Uh, and I, I, some, 
sometimes think it's a little weird, um, but I think it's awesome. Uh, you know, working alone can be boring. And one of the things that the social media has done for me is connect me with a fan base who is interested and engaged, which keeps me interested and engaged. Uh, sometimes the questions you guys ask seem like I get frustrated because I answer them a lot. But, you know, in answering them and, and forcing me to explain what I'm doing and talk about it, it gives me time to think about what I'm doing and to think about how I'm doing and how I'm approaching. And so, you know, all of, all of that stuff is, is what keeps me engaged on those days when I just don't want to be here. Uh, it has also allowed me to connect with conservators all over the world who otherwise I probably would never know and talk about conservation and discuss materials, techniques, approaches. Uh, and, that, and that's just, I mean, say what you will about the internet being a, a tunnel of lightning from hell or a cesspool, there are still some really good attributes uh, about the way it allows us to connect. And that is one of them. Um, let's see, uh, favorite era for paintings, oh, I don't know, um, as long as they're well built, I don't really mind, being in Chicago, have I ever found any really good paintings at the thrift store, I'm not, I don't really hunt for paintings, um, it's not really something I do, uh, I have clients that have, yeah, I have clients that have found some really amazing paintings at thrift stores, uh, is conservation a good business to be in? Oof. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. It, no. I don't know. Um, it's a hard business to be in. It's not really a growth industry. It's not like healthcare where uh, more and more people need it. Um, and it's really hard to keep a business running. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's a good business or not. All right, so now I'm going to start working on some of this area, some of the blues. I'm going to avoid m doing too much of the reds because I want to save those for a little bit later. Um, so again, this is that where I started that grayish color to retouch this area. And I'm just going to use the same area and modify it a little bit as I get into here because the color that the artist used here was blended here. So naturally, if I match this color, I'm going to use it to get to this color. It makes sense, kind of like making a master sauce in cooking. Uh, I can I can kind of use what I've already made, um, and and go from there. Um, can, let's see. Oh boy, oh boy, so many fasts. What's the hardest part of my job? Hmm. What is the hardest part of my job? Uh, the business stuff is probably the least enjoyable. Um, you know, if I didn't have to do that kind of stuff, it would be, and I could just focus on working, it would be, it'd be wonderful. But of course, if you, if you don't focus on the business stuff, you can't do the work. So it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, do I ever get spooked out by being in the studio alone? No. Is, I mean, this is like my second home. Um, the most famous of artists I've conserved? Well, I mean, that's relative to who you think is famous. Uh, I've worked on a John Singer Sargent, uh, a little Jackson Pollock, a um, Albert Tinelli, um, let's see, a Modigliani. Um, I don't know what a barb is, Peter. You're gonna have to explain to me. Uh, If I had an opportunity to work on the Mona Lisa, would I? Hell no. That painting is uh, so fraught with political perils and, um, and minefields that I pity anybody who tries to work on it or is tasked with working on that painting. You know, I don't think it's any different than any other paintings. It's paint on wood. Um, but, you know, it's the most famous painting in all of history. And so there is no way that you could work on that painting and ever come through it unscarred, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I'm generally trying to live my life with as little trauma and drama as I can. Um, 
I know, maybe I should delete the YouTube and the Instagram. Those seem to be fantastic sources of drama that r turns into trauma. Um, I don't speak German or, or Swiss German or Schweizerdeutsch. Uh, it's uh, the only time I ever really heard it was when I was getting in trouble from my father. So I don't really have a positive association uh, with Schweizerdeutsch. Um, it's also a really hard language to learn uh, and pretty limited. Um, I used to speak French, but uh, that's, that, that has since faded quite a bit because I don't really use it on a daily basis. Um, I can read it uh, a little bit better than I can speak it. Uh, is it hard to satisfy clients? Um, not necessarily. I think like anything, it's a matter of uh, expectations before any work is done. And by that, I mean um, making sure the client understands what I can and cannot do, what I will and will not do, and then trying to understand their wants, needs, and expectations so that I can match what I'm doing as close as possible to what they want and need. Um, because, of course, that's the basis for all good relationships, right? Um, communication and being on the same page. Because without that... You, nothing but trouble is going to happen. Um, let's see. Um, I should do this more often. Yeah, the, the funny thing is that, so now I've been at this for nine, an hour and a half. Um, if I wasn't talking to you guys, I would have been done with this painting two or three times over. Um, I'm just going really slow because everybody's got nothing to do. And uh, I don't know. Uh, normally, I'm much faster at retouching um, than I am today, but uh, I'm talking, and talking makes my brain hurt uh, and makes it hard for me to do two things at once. Um, uh, do I want my children to follow this path? No. I want my children to change the world. I want them to develop life-saving drugs, to change our political system, to make music or art that enriches people's lives or, uh, or do something, you know, better than, than me. Um, but if they wanted to do this, uh, we'd have to have a discussion. <laughs> um, I'm going to be streaming until I'm done with this. So I don't know, however, however long, um, have I ever lost my temper with a client? Uh, no, I generally try to keep myself under check and act like an adult and remember that whatever is going on in their world that I may not be privy to is probably having an effect on their behaviors that I'm finding problematic. Um, I've had to fire clients before, which sounds crazy, but you know, sometimes there are clients who you just say, look, I don't think this relationship is working. I guess break up with a client and say, I think you would be better served with somebody else. Um, and I respect your opinions, your whatever, but I just don't think this is going to be a relationship. Um, yeah, I get clients all the time who uh, send me pieces and they say, this will be a video, right? And I have to tell them, ah, you know, my filming schedule is, is booked up or you know, no, um, you know, I'd love to make a video of every painting for every client, but that's, you know, that's just not possible. Uh, toxic paint colors during, um, restoration. Uh, eh, not really. Um, I mean, I don't mix my own colors, so um, I'm not like using toxic pigments. There's plenty of solvents and things I use uh, that are harmful health-wise, but I try to take precautions where I can using PPE, personal protective equipment, respirators, gloves, that kind of stuff. Um, like anybody who works with chemicals, petroleum chemicals and stuff like that, you gotta just take precautions so that you, um, you don't expose yourself uh, let's see what else. Um, 
No, I've never conserved a Bob Ross. I wish I had. I went through that earlier. Um, I've worked on a Thomas Kincaid painting, or a quote-unquote painting. Um, that was fun. Um, scraping or rubbing doable by anyone after a bit of training? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously. Um, you, you can learn this stuff. Everybody who does this learns it at some point, and everybody who does this is bad at it uh, in the beginning. Anybody who tells you otherwise is... Well, you guys can figure it out. Um, uh, what the, uh, um, I don't know how to activate donations. That's not my thing. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of these uh, that uh, would be interesting questions for you guys to see. How did I conserve a Pollock? Well, I mean, kind of the same as anything. A Pollock is no different than this painting, than a George Hetzel. It's just a painting. The name of the artist is impressive, but the work that it needed was not. It just was a little dirty and needed to be restretched. It was a small little study, um, maybe 20 by maybe 10 inches or so. Um, uh, so it wasn't, you know, massive. It, uh, Let's see. Um, is there an eco-friendly way to do conservation and restoration? That's interesting. And there's a lot of discussion within the conservation world right now about sustainability. In fact, the American Institute for Conservation sent out a massive survey to conservators about sustainability um, in, uh, within our work. Uh, it, it, yes, but also no. Um, we still need to use petroleum solvents and petroleum products. Uh, we can recycle them, and I do. Um, I send uh, used uh, solvents off to a chemical recycler. Um, I try to recycle as much of the plastics as I can uh, and things like that. But to some degree, um, you know, you got you to gotta use what you got to use. Um, uh, Nerve-wracking projects, uh, I don't know. At this point, I'm kind of, not to say that I'm not phased by things, but you know, I've, I've been doing this quite a long time and I've seen a lot and I've worked on a lot. Um, I tell you, the thing that makes me nervous is my clients sometimes. The paintings almost never make me nervous, but some clients are really high strung or um, are just really demanding and that just kind of like throws your game off a little bit. But again, that's not really a conservation issue. That's more of like a, a business issue. Um, and uh, there are ways that, to manage that so that it, it doesn't become dominating. Um, how do you conserve paintings that can't be varnished? Well, uh, paintings with thick impasto, and the impasto is the textural buildup of paint. That's when it's thick and, um, and chunky and really seductive. Those can be varnished. There is, absolutely they can be varnished. Um, you just have to take care in removing, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, you just have to take care in how you approach them. Now, there are paintings that cannot be varnished. Paintings that have uh, mixed media sometimes cannot be varnished. Um, you know, if the painting has a photograph on it, you can't varnish over that photograph. If the painting has uh, charcoal on it, you can't do that. Or if it's got objects attached to it, it may not be possible to varnish. And in those cases, it's mostly a measure of preventative conservation, which is kind of a silly thing, silly way of talking about it, um, but it's, it's about talking to the client about uh, how they're going to treat the object, how they're going to care for the object in such a way that would limit the chances that it would be damaged. And that can be, uh, sometimes that's a question of where the piece is displayed. Sometimes that's a question of framing choices. Uh, is it framed in a, let's say, a Lexan or a acrylic box to protect it from the outside world. Um, or, uh, you know, just kind of trying to head off at the pass any of those problems that might um, occur with exposure to the elements or to the world writ large. Um, has anyone handed me a fake or stolen artwork? Ooh, 
Man. Uh, that's a tricky question. And it's tricky because it is not a simple yes or no question. Um, so let me first preface this by saying I'm not an appraiser, nor am I an art historian or a researcher. So I don't authenticate artworks. I, I'm not, that's not my role, that's not my job, that's not something that I have any interest in doing, nor do I have any expertise in doing. Um, but as a conservator who has looked at and worked on thousands and thousands of paintings and who is attuned to the way that paintings are made and how materials age and um, kind of the whole gestalt of the painting as object, I have a unique perspective in that uh, lots of clients come to me with paintings and they say, I need your perspective. I need your expertise on this. Take a look and what do you think? Tell me. And in those cases, what I do is uh, I take a look at the painting and I make a column of pros and cons. And I look at every aspect of the painting from the content of the work. You know, did, does this seem to fit the artist's style? Does this seem to fit their... Um, their narrative style, you know, is the brushwork consistent, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I also look at the materials. Is, are these materials consistent with what we know to be true of the artist? That is, is the, did, did they use this type of paint? Did they use this type of canvas and stretchers? Are the nails or tacks of the era that this painting is purported? Um, you know, is the oxidation on the canvas congruous with a hundred year old painting or um, is there anything that, that is, you know, weird? And I'll make a big list of those and then I will deliver to the client that, that list and I will say, my conclusion is based on the sum of the parts, based on everything that I have, have looked at, I would feel confident in the assumption that this is an authentic painting or based on the sum of the evidence, based on all of the parts that I've looked at, I would not be comfortable making a conclusion that this painting is as it is purported to be. And it's a really delicate way of saying, I don't know, but it doesn't feel right. Or I don't know, but I can't, you know, I, I can't say no. There's no, nothing here that says hard no. And then, you know, I leave it up to my clients to, to take it from there. So have I ever, um, this is a really long winded answer to a really short question. Uh, um, have I ever come across fakes? Yeah, plenty. I have come across pieces that had signatures added so that they looked like they were by a certain artist. I have come across pieces that were comprehensive fabrications um, made to look like uh, the artist. Um, and, and those are really tricky situations because almost every single time, without fail, the person who is bringing me the painting believes the painting to be what uh, it purports. And that's a really tricky conversation to have with a client, to tell them, look, this painting that you just bought is, I, I have serious doubts about its authenticity. And, you know, that's, that's like the, being the bearer of bad news. It's, it's terrible. Uh, it makes me feel lousy. Um, but I owe it to my clients and that's, they pay me for that. They want that. They want me to tell them that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with Interpol and I've worked with, um, uh, uh, the FBI and the stolen art registry, uh, on pieces in the past. And, uh, you know, it's tricky. Um, there's no easy way around it. Suffice to say, I wish there were less of that because it's not part of the world that I, the art world that I like, but it happens. Um, have I ever discovered a work? Um, yeah, absolutely. I have, um, I, have, uh, I have assisted clients, oops, dropped my brush. I have assisted clients in researching and proving artworks to be um, things that, that they, they couldn't otherwise prove themselves. On my website, there's a, a little tab for research, and I, I talk about just a couple of cases where um, I was part of the authentication process for a painting, or um, 
uh, something like that. Um, and that's like the greatest part of the job, right? Not only to give a painting back to a client and say, here it is all cleaned and blah, 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 but hey, I found a signature. And it turns out that this is a pretty important painting. I mean, talk about having a good day. That's like, you just feel like you're on cloud nine after that. Um, what's the most expensive piece? I'll answer the question about the, um, uh, the signatures in a second. What's the most expensive piece of work I've ever worked on? I, you know, to be honest, I don't necessarily know because I don't really care um, how much the pieces are worth. It's it's a kind of a footnote to my job. Um, I have worked on a, I did work on a, a Roy Lichtenstein painting that was valued at about fifteen million dollars. Uh, I worked on a Thomas Hart Benton that was an eight or nine million dollar painting. Um, but you know, the value of the painting has no has has almost no. Um, implication on the work that gets done. And sometimes really valuable paintings, this Liechtenstein just needed a light surface cleaning and it was done in like an afternoon. Um, you know, just because it's expensive doesn't make it interesting. It doesn't make it good art, Velvet Elvis. Um, yeah, I have, um, I, I definitely uh, have seen some Velvet paintings uh, in the past and um, <laughs> and I don't know uh, I mean I don't know I'll just leave it at that um, uh, isolation layer da, da, da. okay so <clears throat> isolation layer and I've tried to talk about this in my videos um, and I'll, I'll talk about it now the, the layer of varnish that I would put down before retouching serves two purposes, sometimes two purposes, not always. The first and foremost would be if the painting is painted in a way or with, material, with paints that are going to change significantly enough after the varnish is applied that the retouching process would be more difficult. And in that I mean, I will put the, the, the first layer of, of uh, varnish down so that I can see what the colors are going to look like. Then I'll do the retouching and then I'll do a final, final varnishing. Um, that facilitates um, better color matching and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the other reason that I would put down an isolation layer is if the original paint layer is vulnerable to the solvents that are used in the retouching paint or to remove the retouching paint. And that is, not all paint is created equal and not all artists paint in the same manner. And so sometimes uh, an artist will use a, a, a product or an, a technique or something and that uh, becomes fugitive or vulnerable. And the use of solvents inside this paint that I'm using or the use of solvents to remove this paint would damage that paint layer. Then I would put down the isolation layer as a method of isolating the original from anything that I've added. But it's not a universally needed, uh, uh, needed thing. It, it, it kind of just depends on, um, on the piece. And so, you know, I'll have to size up the painting and see, um, see what's necessary. Now this painting, uh, ooh, sorry, uh, this painting didn't need, oh, sorry probably gave you all vertigo right there for a second. Um, this painting, the paint layer itself, the original paint was very stable. Wasn't fugitive, isn't vulnerable to the solvents. And it, the colors don't change that radically when it's varnished. So I didn't feel like that was necessary for this painting. Now, the next painting I do, it may be. And so every painting gets taken as a unique, uh, a unique piece and a unique approach. So it's just, there's kind of no universalism about, um, about this. Um, insurance, yeah, I carry a ton of insurance. Um, I have insurance on my building in case somebody slips and falls. I have insurance, uh, I have a specific conservation insurance policy, which I know it sounds crazy, but it's there. It's kind of like doctor's insurance, malpractice, and, and all that kind of stuff, um, and it's, very expensive and I hate paying it because, uh, you know, 
insurance. You hate. Ugh. Nobody wants to pay insurance. But, um, you know, best case, you, you waste a whole bunch of money over your career and you never have to use it, you know. But that is what it is. Um, <laughs> is there a point at which uh, there was something about, like, needing 80% um, uh, retouching or something like that? I mean, yeah. You know, it's tricky. I mean, obviously, if a painting comes in and it needs 80% of the painting retouched, that's not really retouching anymore or conservation. That's creation. And I would generally tell the clients that's not really my role um, and that's not really something that I'm um, suited to. And I would probably tell them, you know, at this point, I think you should, you should probably contact an artist and commission them to recreate, um, recreate the painting. Partially because it would just be so expensive for them to have me do that kind of intricate uh, recreation of a painting, um, you know. And also, I'm not a painter. I'm not an artist. I'm a conservator. And I'm not the one who's best suited to recreating the painting that's damaged. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have clients who try to do work on their own paintings all the time. And uh, it's incredibly frustrating because they, like my small children, they, <laughs> they think that I, I won't know if they lie to me. <laughs> you know? Like, um, they'll bring it in and they'll say, here, da, 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 here's my painting, I need it fixed. And I say, what happened to this? What is going on here? I don't know, nothing. I'm like, come on. Tell me the truth. What happened here? I don't know. It's just, it's just like this. I don't know who broke the cookie jar, said the kid with crumbs on their face. And it's like, come on, fess up. Just own up and also own up and tell me what you did because that is going to be a, an important piece of evidence that will help me determine what I need to do going forward. But if you just kind of lie to me and, and, you know, like that makes my job harder and it also makes the relationship um, much more perilous. Um, an artist and technician. Oh, if I'm on a spectrum between an artist and a technician, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that I am not an artist at work. I am a technician and a craftsman. Um, Artists, uh, artists have a responsibility to the content uh, and creating the content. I don't do that. I don't create. Um, I fix, I fill in, I employ, but I don't have any um, editorial responsibility. How's my dog? She's fine. She needs a haircut very badly, but um, she's good. Why am I so content? That's, isn't that like the $10,000, the $64,000 life question? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I will say this much. I am much more content and calm and patient when I'm at work doing something like this because there's a certain zen about it. It's getting lost in the, the process of doing, I guess, why adult coloring books are so popular right now because um, not having to think and just kind of executing is a very, I don't want to use the word Zen again, but a very meditative uh, thing and uh, getting lost in something, transcending your own current station in life, uh, your own moment, your own Mishigas, that, that's, that's pretty awesome. And so to some degree, this job, even in those moments when it's incredibly frustrating, like scraping or retouching, um, can be transcendent. Um, and that's really, uh, really nice. Uh, clients delivering things back that they are unsatisfied with. Um, I mean, it's happened, you know. Uh, but again, it is more an issue of miscommunication than bad work or the work not measuring up. And by that I mean, you know, the client may have expected that, 
uh, I was going to do something and I didn't communicate well enough that I wasn't. Or they may have expected that I was going to do something or that I wasn't going to do something. I don't know. You know what I mean? Um, that's mostly just miscommunication. And um, miscommunication can always be fixed. That, that There's nothing... That's just like a human thing, right? We, we just got to work on that. Um, uh, da, 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 da. A lot of the questions you guys are asking, I've already answered. Um, I, I mean, I can keep answering them, but I'm just trying to look for things that are novel. Um, well, so many just came by. Have I ever been met with criticisms from other conservators? I, I mean, sure. Right, I think that there's a whole universe of conservators who hate me out there for I don't know what reasons. I mean, just go go to Reddit. I mean, that maybe don't go to Reddit. That's a terrible place, and it's going to make your day really lousy and rotten. Um, you know, I will say this much, and I've talked to plenty of other conservators about it. We in this, in our society, in our world right now, have entered a period where the prevailing way of existing is a zero-sum game. And I'm going to get like kind of abstracty philosophical here for a hot second. <clears throat> and um, you can tune out or, or whatever. Uh, so zero-sum game. Zero-sum game is where in order for there to be a winner, there must be a loser. That by definition, you cannot have, by definition, there cannot, by definition, uh, for one to succeed, one else has to fail. And I think that that's really toxic and really problematic in our society as a whole. And one thing that I found in working as a conservator for 20 some odd years is that conservators are, and I say this knowing many conservators who are amazing, wonderful people, but I think that there are many conservators who are very petty or very um, small. And the idea that one person may be succeeding automatically for them means that they are failing. And so in an effort to raise themselves, they must lower others. And I don't really think that that's a me problem. I think that's a they problem. Um, unfortunately, everybody has a microphone or a megaphone now, and everybody feels like their opinions um, need to be screamed from the rooftops. And that can be really uh, troubling and problematic. I, I will say this much. I have been doing this for a while, and I have yet to receive any emails, any phone calls, or any direct communication from any conservators in the world who, have, who, who take issue with what I'm doing. I don't go on Reddit or uh, Facebook to look for that stuff. And my feeling is that, you know, my, my phone number is all over the web. I, you know, I answer questions on my Instagram. If there's an issue that one takes with me, I am here. I am available and open, and we can discuss it. We can talk about it. We can figure out what, is the, pro what the problem is, and we can hopefully come to a resolution. But for those people who wish to um, take up a cause of uh, trashing me or criticizing me anonymously or in a shielded forum um, or something like that, I, I just don't have time in my life for that. Uh, and I don't engage in it, and I don't think it's healthy for me, for, for the people doing it, and for the people on the sidelines hooting and hollering. Anyhow, um, just be kind. Uh, watercolors can be conserved. You need to speak to a, a paper conservator. 
Um, Strangest stories uh, of conservation? I don't know. You kind of see them all. There was one cool piece that I had, and I think it's up on my Instagram, way down deep in there. I don't. You'll never find it because Instagram is not doesn't make looking at the past easy. Um, I had a painting that came in. Actually, here are two interesting ones. Uh, one had a hole in the lower quadrant, and. Of course, my inclination was to tell the client, well, let's, let's fix this, right? Let's, let's bridge it or reweave it, or I can't remember what I proposed. And they said, no, 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 no. We do not want the hole fixed. I said, but, you know, it's, it's problematic for the canvas. And it also, I mean, you have a hole in your painting, right? Dear Liza, dear Liza, I mean, let, like, let's fix it. Let's put the painting back together. And they said, no, 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 no. And they, they wouldn't tell me anything more. They just kept saying no. And I, at one point I said, listen, I don't know that I'm going to be able to work with you if, if, you, if this is how this is going to go. And they said, this painting, that, uh, this painting was owned by our family, blah, 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 eons ago during the Civil War. And that hole is a bullet hole from the Confederate Army when they stormed, I don't remember the exact details, when they stormed the, our, the town where my blah, 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 blah. And my relatives were killed or something like that, but the painting survived. And that is more important to us than this being a painting. This is an artifact of our family history. And so I said, oh, I get it. Okay, cool. All right. We can fix that. I can fix the painting while preserving the whole. And so we came up with a novel solution of maintaining the damage to the painting while making sure that it wouldn't perpetuate uh, any more damage. And that was, that was a really cool, fun project because it forced me to think outside of my standard um, processes for addressing those fairly rote um, problems. Um, I had another one where it was a painting that was in, uh, in Germany during the war. It was owned by a Jewish family. And there was in the um, center of the painting where the two, two figures were cavorting, so to speak. Uh, there was a massive tear puncture dent, and it was the shape of a rifle butt. And that was where a uh, stormtrooper had come in and smashed the painting. And the owner explicitly did not want that um, fixed because it served as a remembrance uh, of the trauma that their family had been through. And um, it was important to them that 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 damage be kept as a thumb in the nose of those who would try to eliminate that family. So not to get heavy, but um, those were some really interesting projects because, uh, you know, it, it, how do you, it's kind of like a man walks into an emergency room with a knife stuck into his skull and says, yeah, but, but keep a knife there because I want, you know, it's, it's a good memory of a crazy night. <laughs> you know, it's like, whew. Um, you know, it's like, okay, well, we'll figure, we'll figure it out. Um, let's see. I kind of just went off on some wild tangents. What is the, one of the most difficult things to learn as an apprentice conservator? Ooh, there are so many difficult things to learn as a conservator. Uh, restraint is hard. Um, knowing when to pull back and stop is hard because we all want to continue to plow ahead and, and we, we are taught, you know, no pain, no gain, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, but being able to identify, step outside of yourself and say, okay, okay, you know what? I'm losing my focus. I'm, it's time to stop. It's also sometimes hard to identify when you need to be more aggressive and say, okay, I'm gonna, I gotta lean into this and really push it because that can be scary. So limits, I guess, would be the hardest things to, to learn as a conservator. I mean, you know, if you do 10,000 hours of retouching, you will be good at retouching. If you do 10,000 hours of scraping, you will be good at scraping. Those are just mechanical um, skills that you can learn and you can refine and you can hone over your career. But some of the, the other ones about learning limits and um, learning how to push yourself or learning where and when 
and, and being able to identify moments and indicators that you are starting to get tired or, you know, lose your focus. Those, those are really, really hard. Um, let's see. How do these bots know? I don't know. Um, hello, Netherlands. Um, what's the most difficult or challenging project I've had to work on? Um, okay. I have a really interesting and challenging <clears throat> one that I'm working on now. Yes, I will be making a video of it. Um, one that I worked on many, many years ago that was really difficult was a painting had come into the studio and it had been, it was flaking, it had been water damaged. So the entire painting was kind of falling off of the canvas. All the paint looked like little curled potato chips peeling off. And at some point, somebody had poured on the surface, had, had taken, had put on the surface, I'm sorry, a piece of silk, a very thin, transparent piece of silk, and then poured on top of that silk a good two millimeters or so worth of polyurethane. Dun, dun, dun. I know. It's like my least favorite word in the, in the entire language. And they did that to try to like encase the painting so that none of that paint would flake off. But of course, I mean, that's just absolutely absurd and terrible. And the client wanted me to fix it. And also the polyurethane had yellow because that's what polyurethane does. So not only was the painting, it was a lots of loss and um, did the paint look terrible, but it was really yellow. Uh, and really, the, the problem in that case was that the paint layer, the paint itself, wasn't really bonded to the canvas anymore because of the water damage. The uh, original canvas was so kind of water damaged and deteriorated that it was soft and like powdery and it didn't really have any fidelity anymore. So what I ended up doing was something called a paint film transfer. And I've done a few of these in my career. Uh, I did some with my father and I've done some on my own. And Paint film transfer is effectively like open heart transplant, or heart transplant, <laughs> open heart. Um, it is the most extreme, most risky, most involved, most difficult procedure that you can do. And you only do it when you've run out of other options. And a paint film transfer is where you are effectively removing the paint, the gesso, from the canvas or the wood, and adhering it, putting it onto a new support. And I needed to do that because I couldn't remove the surface coating, the silk and the polyurethane, without first re-adhering the paint back down to a support. Because if you remember, it, it was so perilous and that, that original canvas was so deteriorated, if I tried to remove the polyurethane and that silk, it would have just taken the original paint right up. And that was an incredibly stressful, incredibly time-consuming, incredible nerve-wracking process. And I, had done, I did that probably the year after my father passed away. And so I was still kind of rattled by my father's passing and not having him there in the studio to bounce ideas off of and to, um, you know, just, he was the master. Um, and you know, I, I technically, I knew what I was doing and I had done it before, but it still felt really intense and really high stakes. And the piece came out wonderful. It was a total success, but I, I probably aged more <laughs> during that conservation than any other time in my life. That's how, uh, how, how how intense my days felt. Um, you know, now uh, looking back on it, um, I have fond memories of it, but um, at the time, geez, did it feel heavy and um, kind of made me want to throw up every, every moment of every day. Um, oh boy. Uh, some advice for people who want to get into conservation. Uh, you know, my path was really unique. 
So I'm not necessarily the best person to give you guys advice. I, I will say this much. Conservation degree programs are pretty much open to anybody. Uh, they'll, they'll have certain requirements. Some may require you to do an, an apprenticeship, uh, pre-program apprenticeship or internship, I'm sorry. Um, you know, some may have requirements about chemistry or art history and all, all that kind of stuff. One thing that I have found interesting, curious, is that I, I generally don't see, and maybe I'm not looking hard enough, so certainly that's a possibility. I don't see studio arts as a requirement for many of these conservation programs. And that strikes me as really interesting because, <laughs> I mean, the ability to work with materials, the ability to be comfortable using new techniques uh, and new tools and new approaches is paramount. I mean, not a week goes by when I have to try something that I've never tried before. And the education that you get in studio arts, trying to understand the art making process and trying to learn how to make the art yourself, how to take idea and materials and techniques and tools and, and m master all of those in the same moment to produce something is so important. And I feel like and, and, I've, and, I, and I, have seen peop, I have seen the work, I have talked to and seen work of conservators who don't have studio degrees or, or people who are learning conservation. And, and I can tell who doesn't have a studio arts background. And it's kind of like saying, <sighs> I mean, I've said before, it's kind of like being a food critic and never having entered a kitchen before. You know, I mean, you can be a critic, but the understanding that you're going to get is going to be so much broader if you have tried making these dishes before or if you understand the difficulty in using that knife or that tool. And so for conservators, I don't know. I, I, and this is just a personal thing that I, I feel. I think that if you want to be a conservator, start with studio arts. You can, you can learn chemistry or you can learn the phone numbers and email addresses of chemists who will always be more proficient than you. And by that, I mean, there's a, there's a little anecdote and I don't know if it's 100% true, um, but it serves the purpose of this story. Uh, there was a point at which, some, at some point in Einstein's life, uh, somebody asked him what the full theory of relativity was. Not, not the E equals MC squared, but like the long, complicated one. And he, he said, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. And the, the person asked, turned and said, oh my God, what do you mean you don't know? I'm, uh, uh, uh. And he laughed and he said, I can just go look it up. And it's cute and whether or not it's 100% true, who cares? The point is, um, I do not have a degree in chemistry because chemistry is not my strong suit. But I have a Rolodex or I have a ad phone, phone full of numbers of chemists who are so much smarter than I could ever be. And when I have a problem, I just call them up and I say, hey, Tom, hey, Chris, I have a chemistry question for you. And in five minutes, they've provided me the answer or they've told me what I need to know. And so sometimes being good at a job is more about knowing where your limits are and knowing how to surround yourself with people who are better than you at that job, right? Um, I will never be an amazing chemist, but I know where to find them. And so that puts their entire arsenal of information at my disposal, right? And that's just information. But I, I think I am really good at... Um, technical, practical execution, working with tools in my hands and stuff like that. So I can take whatever information I've been given, synthesize it, and then employ it very successfully. Anyhow. Um, uh, let's see. How do, I, how do paintings get in and out of the studio? Um, like, like literally how they, do they get in and out? The door? 
Um, I think you mean, like, how do paintings come here? Uh, people deliver them on their own. Um, art facilitation companies, art transportation companies pack them and bring them here. Um, FedEx, UPS, DHL. Yeah, I mean, those, those, those companies move more packages than anybody else, and they do a fantastic job, provided that you have packed the paintings well enough. Um, how has recording for YouTube uh, changed how I operate? Um, it, it hasn't changed how I do the work. It just changes the pace and how I design my schedule because any project that I'm doing for filming is gonna take longer. So I have to build that into, um, uh, I have to build that in and, and kind of work around that. You know, like may take twice as long to, um, to, to, to do what biggest change in all things. I'm just kind of looking to see some of these. Um, yeah, DHL exists in America. Um, <clears throat> so what, what like updating my techniques and approaches and stuff like that? Um, so I, I, I am a member of the AIC and I uh, am a member of their forums and I subscribe to the Journal of the American Institute for Conservation, the Getty Conservation, the Canadian Conservation Newsletters, and a whole bunch of other um, conservation publications. And <clears throat> I read those uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, I read those as if they are the Bible. Those are where the research conservators, um, the ones who are working in universities or museums and who have access to millions of dollars of uh, equipment and massive budgets and research staffs, that's where they are pushing the bleeding edge of conservation. And some of that stuff is just really, really, really interesting. And some of it is really, really boring. Um, but it is imperative that as a conservator, you are, are up to date and reading and digesting all of that information because you, you know, somebody may come up with a, a, a new material, a better varnish, and one that you may want to, to try or may come up with an approach to a problem that has been stumping you or may cause you to, you know, they may come up with uh, a replacement for a material that you've been using or something like that. So kind of being um, uh, up to date on that kind of stuff um, is, is really important. Um, um, has a client ever asked me to redo work that somebody else has done? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just gonna have to say I'm getting a UPS delivery in about a minute or so, so I'm gonna have to step away uh, for just a hot second when he comes in so I can sign for it. Um, and then I will talk about having to take on projects that have been previously uh, approached. So give me one second. I'm going to get this package. Oh, we're all good. I guess we don't have to sign for things anymore. Um, so that was that. Um, okay, so working on paintings that have been worked on before from other conservators. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have other conservators. There have been instances where other conservators have contacted me and said, you know, I'm, I'm stuck. I have a problem that I can't wrap my head around. Can we talk about it? And that's awesome um, because I learn a lot from that experience too. Uh, and I, I take it as really a very humbling um, and cherished experience when somebody else asks for your expertise. And I've done that to other conservators, um, contacted them because they have a particular experience with a, an artist or a material uh, and said, hey, I'm, I'm stumped. Um, or can I pick your brain? Or, hey, I know you worked on this artist's paintings before. Um, you know, can I pick your brain because I have one in the studio? And the overwhelming, overwhelming experience is always positive. Um, it's, it's collaborative uh, and um, helpful and is really rewarding and uplifting. And it's kind of like the, the best part of the job. Um, I have also had paintings from other conservators who have contacted me and said, listen, I'm in a pinch here. I think I might be in over my head. Um, here's what I did. Here's what didn't work. I, 
I need a bailout. And, you know, it's tricky. Um, because on one hand, it's like being asked to clean up somebody else's mess, right? You're being asked to be Harvey Keitel in Pulp Fiction and clean up a messy car. And it, you know, it, it's like, uh, come on, man, you, you could have avoided this mess in the first place. On the other hand, it is also a sign of respect, and so you have to keep your mouth shut, you bite your tongue, you treat the other person with respect because they are coming to you vulnerable, and it is not your place to um, take advantage of that vulnerability or to make them feel worse. Lord knows they probably feel bad as is. And you just work through it and um, you be respectful and you take it as a, a big compliment that they asked you to clean up their mess. Now, that said, you, you only get like, <laughs> it's a very limited number of times, one, <laughs> that somebody can call me and say, hey, I'm in over my head. I messed something up. I need you to fix it. The first time is like, okay, yeah, we'll figure it out. The second time, now you're going to get read the riot act. And, you know, there is no lesson in the second kick of a mule. And if you go back to that mule to get the second kick, I don't know. I mean, maybe you have to learn a really hard lesson. Um, as, oh, man, there was a question I really just wanted to shoot. Um, there was a, has a client ever asked you? I saw it, and I didn't have time to read it. Um, oh, jeez, so fast. Uh, well, I'll just have, I'll just have to wait. Um, has a client ever asked me to leave the damage on a painting? Is, is that what it was? Yeah, I just talked about um, a couple pieces that the client specifically wanted the damage left and not, um, and not conserved. But it's rare. I mean, most people want their artwork to look as good as possible. They want it, you know, to shine, to, to be a high point in their homes or their, their collections. So most people don't really want their damage, their, their pieces damaged. Um, oh, has somebody ever asked me to take something out of a painting or paint something out of a painting? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've had people ask me to put mustaches on, um, uh, on figures within paintings because it reminded them of their grandfather or um, to paint out things. You know, I had, had one woman brought me a picture of a nun and the nun was wearing a crucifix because nuns. And the woman said, I, but I, I don't like religious icon iconography in my, um, in my home. So if you would just paint out that crucifix, everything would be fine. <laughs> and they were just kind of like, lady, if you don't like, if you don't like peanuts, then don't order them on your banana split, right? Like, I, I don't know. Like, if you don't like fish, don't go to a sushi restaurant. Um, if you... <laughs> If you don't like religious icons, then don't buy a religious icon painting. And I told her that, respectfully, that's something that I wasn't comfortable with doing uh, and that uh, I wouldn't be able to satisfy that request of hers. And, you know, she got, she was not very happy. And she said, well, then why am I paying? I said, well, you don't have to pay me. You can find somebody else who, who will do that. I just won't. Um, and ultimately, she ended up uh, having me do the work, and I, I did not paint out the crucifix. Uh, and the painting came out fine, came out beautiful, and um, everything was fine. Um, do I have a go-to cathartic thing uh, with my high concentration work? I fire a shotgun at a Civic? No, I don't fire a shotgun at, the, at a Civic in the back. Um, uh, what do I do to keep my balance with doing such hard... And then I'll talk about what made me start the YouTube channel. I know you've, you, that's been asked quite a bit. Um, and about how the... Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I, I ride bikes a lot. I race my bicycle. And so I, I do a lot of workouts and group bike riding. Not so much right now because of our current situation. Um, and that, uh, that, that's a great stress reliever. Um, it really keeps me balanced and grounded. 
um, home projects, you know, renovating my house and, and working on it um, is also really, uh, really cathartic. Um, there is something about uh, doing hard physical labor that exhausts the body and frees up the mind um, that is very cathartic and very releasing and balancing. And so um, while I don't think that my work here is particularly physically stressful, uh, it's probably more mentally uh, taxing. So perhaps that's why I am um, drawn to uh, things like, I don't know, like bike racing where you, you mostly punish yourself for very little reward. Um, uh, what, um, what's the most annoying thing that a stranger on the internet has told me to do about my job? Uh, well, anytime a stranger tells me how to do my job, it's kind of annoying, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's part of the, um, it is part of, uh, the deal, right? You can't ask for attention without criticism. So I just generally try to explain my opinions in a, as polite of a way as I can. Uh, and if they are insistent, I just move on with my life and let them have their, I don't know, let them stew in whatever anger they're stewing in. Um, what bike do I have? Uh, I have a couple, but my primary bike is a Colnago C60. Um, and that means nothing to most of you guys, but to those of you who know bikes, you'll, you'll know. Um, I'm a cat too. Uh, I don't race the track. Um, that's more bike racing stuff. Um, would I ever make bike videos? God, no. Um, no, no, definitely not. Wristwatches. Um, I have a bunch of, uh, Victronox wristwatches. Um, long story there, not worth getting into. Um, but, uh, they're great watches, good timepieces. Um, I'd like to have more and, but you know, you know, whole nother story. Um, I, I try not to be shady with people on Instagram, to be honest with you. Uh, and when I do end up being shady or, or spill tea or, or something like that, I really feel bad. I mean, I honestly do because I try really hard to make sure that my channel, my page, my feed, what I am putting out there is wholesome, um, is productive, uh, and gives back something to our world, and I just don't feel like engaging in, um, what will we do without the Tour de France? Tour de Zwift. Um, I don't feel like engaging in that kind of pettiness does anybody any favors. So I really honestly feel lousy on, um, anytime I, I, I lose my cool or, um, or, or shame anybody or something like that. And I, I and honest, honestly also, it makes me feel really bad when my fans and followers do that to other people too. And I get that you guys all want to like defend me and um, my work and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm beyond grateful for that support, but I don't know. It, I mean, like imagine having like the whole internet dump on you all at once. That's just gotta be a really lousy feeling. Whether or not you deserve it, I don't know. It's not for us to judge. So I always ask that people just refrain. If somebody comes and is popping off on my page, I'll take care of it. You know, I'll smack the band hammer, and uh, and they'll be gone. But I don't, I don't really need other people to um, to chime in and start to tear down other people because honestly, it doesn't even feel good for for the person who's tearing down the other person. I don't know. Kind of feels like uh, maybe you're letting a you're swallowing some some poison just so that you can spit it back out, and some of that poison is going to stay inside. Um, let's see what else. Um, we do. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I got my one million play button. I totally forgot to do anything about it. I'll I'll put something um, up on on Instagram about it or something. And I just got really busy. Funny stories of clients. Oh man. So there was this, this client, um, <laughs> one of those cases where, uh, sometimes the client doesn't know best this client. So 
One is, I'll tell you two. One is funny and one is uh, ob objectionable subject matter um, I'll, in a second and then why I started the YouTube. Okay. Um, <sighs> okay. Uh, this client uh, had a long-term client and um, after my father passed away, the client came in um, with some paintings and, and uh, was nervous though. He said, you know, you know, I've been coming to your father for 20 years uh, before you were even, even born and I trusted him implicitly and, uh, you know, I like you, Julian, uh, but I'm just nervous. I'm, I'm kind of anxious and I hope you can understand I'm just not really yet comfortable with you. And I said, um, I mean, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm sure that that took a lot for you to, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it took a lot for you to say that to me. And, and I respect that you would say that and that you would feel comfortable enough to say that to me. Uh, and I said, however, you, I have been working with my father for the past oh, eight or nine years. In those eight or nine years, he hasn't touched a single one of your paintings. And so my assumption, because you keep coming back, is that the quality of work that I am delivering to you is satisfactory. Well, of course, he turned red in the face and was very embarrassed. And I said, listen, this is a new world for me too. We'll figure it out. We just have to be open and communicate and honest with each other, and we will figure it out and the relationship has blossomed ever since. Uh, I had another client who repeatedly would tell me, and my father, never varnish my paintings. I hate varnished. <laughs> and the thing is, is that he had family at his home. You know, he had young children and dogs, and it was not a great environment for unvarnished paintings to be in because, you know, dogs slobber and spit and kids do crazy things. And so... He, he came to me again after my father died, and I maybe mean, there's a theme here, and uh, he said, you know, da, 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 and your father never varnished any paintings. Da, 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 da. And I said, oh, okay, fine, whatever you want. But we had always varnished his paintings because he didn't know better in that case. And so I gave him a painting back with a completely flat varnish, and he said, now this... This is what I'm talking about. Sometimes your father didn't know anything and he would always varnish my paintings and this is beautiful, look at that. Completely flat, not a drop of varnish on here. This is a gorgeous, ah, oh, this is a beautiful job. I turned to him and said, oh, you know, there's a varnish on there, buddy. Just like on every other one of your paintings. And he, he laughed, he said, no, 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 that's not true. And I, I showed him, I, I said, yeah. We put the varnish on because you have brought us paintings in the past and said, well, you know, my dog was jumping on the couch and his slobber got on the painting or, you know, my kid got this crayon and got on the painting. And the reason those were so easy to conserve is because there was a varnish on them. And, uh, and of course, then he said, well, I still think they shouldn't be varnished, but uh, okay, you've proved your point. Um, what else? Um, uh, let's see here. Let's restore signatures. Actually, it's an interesting question. So I'm going to raise up the uh, easel. Uh, and... Uh, all right. Let's move some stuff around. And let's get, oh, whoops, okay. Now we have to lower it. What are my goals for 2020? Oh my God, make it through 2020. Does that count as a goal? <sighs> I don't know, six months ago I would have thought that was a, uh, a given and pretty straightforward, but it feels like, uh, Feels like just maybe getting through this year will be an achievement for everybody. Um, I, oh, I would never write a book. I'm not a good writer. Um, uh, do my clients see my videos? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, they definitely see my videos and I have had several clients use the videos uh, as part of the, um, 
the pitch, the sales pitch or something like that uh, when they go to sell their works. Um, uh, but mostly I think they just like it for the entertainment. I mean, there's something cool about seeing your piece being conserved. Uh, and again, I wish I could do every, every piece, make a video, but it's just too time consuming. Um, 2020, it's 2019 electric boogaloo, okay. I mean, yeah, man, why not? Um, <clears throat> okay, so here we have a signature. And um, this is, I'll actually talk about conservation for a second. Um, and uh, instead of just rambling on about blah, blah, blah. So part of this signature is potentially missing, but I'm not gonna retouch it because it's not my job to do that. And that is to say, there is enough of this signature here that we know who the artist is. We have the date, we have the signature. There's also some labels on the back. So the, the provenance is not in question. If I were to fill in the missing pieces of the signature, if I were to add to this painting, if I were to enhance the signature or complete it, when this painting is looked at under blacklight, that work would become visible. And that would be a big problem for the owner. Because anybody is going to look at that and say, wait a minute, why is that signature, what's going on with that? And even though the painting is authentic, even though we have no doubt about who made the painting, the fact that any doubt could even be cast upon the painting puts the whole provenance into question. And it creates a problem for my clients when they go to sell it. So I'm not going to enhance or fill in or strengthen this signature. And that's a, that is a very hard line. I won't do it. And in fact, I don't know any conservator who would. If a signature is skinned and partially removed, so be it. We don't tinker with signatures. It is one of those areas that is a hard red line for me. And maybe another conservator may say, well, you know, we know it's George Hetzel, so we can, we can fill it in and we have pictures of his signature. In fact, I have several of his paintings here so I could copy it. I'm not gonna do that. And it's one of those cases where I'd rather be safe than sorry. And so I'm just gonna touch up the little areas of missing paint where the white is and whatever was here before, if there was something, it's gone now. It was lost. I'm not going to try to put it back. I don't want to create a situation where my client has to start explaining things and where a potential buyer gets nervous or can kick the tires, so to speak, and create problems for my client. So that's how I feel about signatures. I don't touch them. I don't mess with them. It's just not there's nothing to be gained in that situation. All right, so a couple little more spots, and then I think, I think we may be done. Um, let's see. Um, oh, YouTube question, sorry, sorry. Uh, you've been asking a billion times. You've been very patient. Sorry. What made me start the YouTube channel? Um, you know, uh, the first video I did was the conservation of the William Merritt Chase painting. And you can tell it's the first one because it's pretty low res. It's, um, it's old. Uh, it's the first one on my, my feed. <clears throat> and uh, it's got a different kind of feel to it. Um, William Merritt Chase is a painter who I've long admired, and this is a really grand painting, and I thought it would be really cool to make a video and uh, preserve the conservation for posterity. Also, to show people what it is I do, you know, I had a lot of friends who would say, well, what is it that you do? i say, oh, I'm an art conservator. they say, well, what is that? That sounds, that sounds fake. That's not a thing. It's not a real job. And so I said, yeah, no, I mean, this is what I do, and I explain it, and they look at me and say, uh, no, 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 still not a job. And so I thought, well, maybe I can just say, go to my YouTube and you'll, you'll see what I do. So I hired a videographer to come in and film uh, the video as I was directing it. 
and um, we edited it, edited, ed yeah, edited it, it up, and I put it up, and kind of the rest is history, as they say. Um, I got a lot of requests on that video for a narration, and so I did one, and then people started saying, more, more, and uh, you know, you, you feed the beast. Um, this is a real job. Yes, uh, it is a real job. Uh, let's see. Um, I really don't see racist art or offensive art all that much. I don't, I don't really think, I don't know, maybe it exists. Maybe there are people who are deliberately making hateful art, but the, the, I guess what, what would make it a little bit more complicated is that if it's made within the art world, it, it may be a parody or maybe a commentary. So it gets a little tricky. Um, but, I, you know, I don't really see things that are offensive. Um, uh, you know, um, let's see. So uh, let's take a look at this painting. <sighs> Oh, I'm gonna have to lower it down. Have I restored anything my father has restored? Yeah, actually I have, um, which is kind of cool uh, because it came in a couple, of, <clears throat> a couple of times. It's come in from people who my father didn't do the work for. So it's um, uh, like, a, like it's been sold, bought, all that kind of things. And that's, uh, that's kind of cool. There's a nice um, synchronicity or circle of life kind of thing. Um, I actually did see one painting that I, I conserved on Antiques Roadshow once, which was really cool because I was just watching it, um, you know, just just watching it and it popped up and I was like, huh, that looks real. No way, oh my God. And they turned it around and there was the little label we, we my father and I had put on. And of course I had to call my father and it was just like, oh my God, turn on PBS. You'll never believe this. Uh. That was before all the Instagram and the YouTube and stuff like that. So that was like the closest brush of fame. Um, and that was really cool. Um, so I guess, I mean, the retouching is, is all complete. Uh, it took, what, it's just an 160, <laughs> 161 minutes to do probably 30 minutes worth of retouching. Um, but you know, that, that wasn't the point of, of this. So, um, I guess that's that's about it uh, for this piece. Um, I will definitely post a before uh, and after of this video. Uh, the, I will post a before and after photo of this painting on my Instagram so that you guys can see what it looked like when it came into the studio. Um, and uh, I, I don't, I guess that's it. I don't really have anything else to show you guys um, right, right now. Um, I will put this stream up on my YouTube channel so that you guys can rewatch it and relive all the glory and, and all the funny lulls and, um, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, it seems like you guys enjoyed this. So, uh, maybe next time. All right, here, we'll do this. Hey, so maybe next time um, we will do one, I will do one of the cleaning process uh, and set up uh, the tripod so that you guys can see how a painting is cleaned in real time. Um, maybe I'll do another live stream retouching. Uh, this seemed pretty fun. My voice is a little hoarse right now, but uh, I have enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for um, coming and hanging out with me and listening to me ramble on and all that kind of stuff. I hope you guys have a wonderful, lovely rest of your day or evening or whatever the case is. Um, I love you all very much. Thank you for um, coming and being part of my job and my life. Um, and I hope all of you guys uh, take care of yourselves. And, um, and that's about it. Anyhow, see you guys.